crafted by the bylaw committee, which we have done. And um, if you, um, well, I, I, I could put that up on the screen, but if anybody, I don't think it's necessary. It's, we've pretty much adhered to that in our, uh, our construction of the bylaw. Um, a bit of history, uh, of course, you've, you've got pretty much the history in the background, but I'll just enumerate some of it. Um, pretty much we started by canvassing other towns as to what their uh, build, permanent building committees uh, were like and what they, um, how they made them up. And here's, this is just a partial list. Uh, everybody, everybody on the committee did this, but there's ones that I've, I've had in my notes. Uh, Belmont, Brookline, Kingston, uh, Mansfield, Westboro, Wellesley, Weston, Arlington, Chelmsford, Norwood, and Sharon, and, and, and others. <coughs> Um, and we essentially took some basic facts or basic tenets of how they put theirs together uh, for ours. Uh, uh, and we, we put it together. Testing, thank you. Uh, we, we put it together into a, um, into a, a first draft uh, that encompassed, encompassed a lot of the general practices, mainly the makeup of the committee, um, their duties and responsibilities, although well, there's an interesting thing about that, uh, and also this concept of a cost threshold uh, after which the, the building committee becomes involved. Below it, they don't. Above it, they do. Um, it was interesting in looking at some of the, uh, the other bylaws of other towns, how involved uh, they got in their, de their definition of what the, the duties and responsibilities of the committee were. Uh, Obviously, some of them were written by um, you know, either you know legal staff or someone that they really distilled it into you know very minute requ requirements, you know party the first part sort of things like that. Uh, we decided not to. Uh, we essentially distilled it into a simple sentence. Um, can you bring scroll it up a little bit? Yeah. There it is. Essentially. The PBC shall be responsible for the oversight and management of all major municipal and school building design studies and construction projects, having expected aggregate costs to exceeding $2 million. Rather than enumerate, I guess, exactly what they do at each, at each step of the way, we just decided to, to leave it that, uh, that broad um, so that it, it's, it's well understood that they are responsible for the oversight and management of, of uh, municipal building projects. Um, and another thing that came out of this is uh, in distilling the instructional motion with other towns is that there is a benefit, uh, and I think a benefit that it's uh, sought after in the instructional motion to have, I guess, a core or a, a, a group of people who are um, uh, the heart of the committee who will continue on as time goes on with an institutional memory of building projects and be composed of people who are experienced with building projects. And that's where we came down with the idea of having a core group of permanent members, five in number, which we thought was a, uh, an ideal number uh, to maintain uh, and uh, continue on as uh, participants in all building projects. Um, they were to have the, the responsibilities um, that you see up there and it was supposed to be the only committee in town that would have those responsibilities. Uh, that's, uh, that's again the reason for the simple language is that it's supposed to be a blanket responsibility for projects. Um, the other thing which we thought was, uh, we thought was innovative but it turns out other, other communities have done it is that when a building project is proposed by a sponsoring agency, sponsoring agency being you know a, a, uh, another uh, committee in town school, um, uh, board of selectmen, library, uh, cemetery trustees, that that sponsoring agency be able to add uh, two additional members to the building committee to form the project building committee, which would be, be composed of seven people. Um, that would be the, op the, the functioning building committee that takes a project uh, from uh, concept through construction. And so the sponsoring agency would have two members out of the seven uh, to represent their interests, essentially, uh, and share the responsibilities as well. So um, that was, uh, we thought that would be a, a good 
uh, way of producing an expandable uh, building committee that would um, uh, essentially represent uh, the, the interests of the sponsoring agency, but also stay true to the intent of the instructional motion, which is to have uh, the, the core group m uh, managing the project uh, as, as well as can be expected. So, um, the, the next thing to do was uh, to set a cost threshold at which this committee would take over any, any project that's proposed. And you'll notice that we used $2 million up here. That is, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting um, discussion. We started off um, with 350000 and that number came from me, essentially as a, um, a number that really you get above the, the you know, one-time maintenance issue. I, I, I based it on essentially replacing a rooftop unit, uh, which I do a lot of myself. Um, but that sort of uh, project is, as was pointed out to us when we sent it out for feedback, is competently handled right now by facilities management. And that threshold was asked to be raised to the $2 million. Um, interestingly enough, other towns uh, who I guess do not have the the wonderful facilities departments we have, have set those thresholds as low as $25,000, um, at which point the building committee takes over and manages everything. Um, one, I think, uh, more than one, couch it in terms of uh, bonded debt, that as, as long as any project has to be borrowed, has to borrow money for it, uh, the building committee would be responsible for it. Uh, we didn't do that because it's conceivably, uh, you could get a project that uh, would not be, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to think of in, in these days, but a, a project that would not be, um, uh, debt would be sold for, would come out of operating. Far-fetched, I realize, but uh, um, that, we didn't want to sort of lock us into that by, by making it bond to debt. Uh, that's why we, we kept it as aggregate costs. And those aggregate costs are meant to mean uh, anything that involves a project, I'm talking, including studies. Studies would eventually, uh, as you know, studies usually are, the cost of studies are usually lumped into the project uh, at the end for um, uh, mainly reimbursement pro or funding uh, reasons. But um, that's that. Sorry, next, next, stuff, next subject. Um, we also wanted the uh, Permanent Building Committee to be a, the, essentially the repository of knowledge of any contemplated buildings going on at once. Uh, that's why there's this little paragraph at the end. If you can scroll down. Um, it says the PVC shall work with. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, the sponsoring agency shall notify the PVC of an intention to undertake any such project within seven days, seven calendar days of a positive vote or general affirmation to do so. Uh, that's mainly to keep them informed. Um, we didn't want to have a number of. I think one of the, the we thought the one of the re, one of the focuses of the intention the instructional motion was to be aware have one committee be aware of what's going on all over town in 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 disparate committees who don't necessarily talk to each other uh, that I think uh, would it doesn't give them management it doesn't give them oversight I mean it doesn't give them sorry power veto or any you know advice giving, you just have to know what's going on. So that, um, when we get down to the last idea uh, about co compiling an inventory of what's going on uh, to this, this body, they will know and be able to tell town meeting what's going on from all over town. That's, it's supposed to be the, the, the hub of any uh, building projects that are going on in town. Mr. That's Strubel, the do you need more time? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think I may need another five minutes. Is there any objection? Not appearing, Mr. Struble. Thank you. Um, so, um, the next thing is uh, trying to explain why there is an abstention on the vote, and that was me. Um, part and parcel of what this building committee will be doing, it will be dealing with uh, school buildings. It's, it's not meant to, it, there's no distinction between school buildings and town buildings. It's all municipal buildings, and school buildings fall under that. But the school building uh, uh, funding arrangements now are different from than they were back when I was on the, the, the building committee, school building committee of long ago. 
in that the state now has a good deal more involvement in the school building committee uh, that a town produces or must have in order to get state participation in the funding. And uh, at the time that we took this vote, December 8th, I was uh, involved in doing research with the MSBA um, and had not gotten all the information yet. So I thought something would come along that might be valuable, so I abstained. And here's the reason why. Um, the middle of the, uh, of the article, we're talking about associate members. Uh, the idea there is to have, like as we said before, the, um, the sponsoring agency have a say and, and uh, you know, a sharing in the uh, production of the, of, the school, of the building. But the MSBA does now have the power of uh, approval over what that school building committee would be. And they have, uh, even though it's couched in the statutes as recommendations for certain members on the committee and certain numbers, um, it's a very strong recommendation. I, I, this is what I was waiting for. I had to talk to a lawyer at the MSBA. Um, because, you know, is it required? Because we're shaping our bylaw about this and we want to be able to include uh, school buildings for it. And she responded saying it's a very strong recommendation. And what they want to do, uh, if Bob, perhaps you can put this up, they now, there's a, the form, yeah, not the background, let's see, is the form, the sample form. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen a sample form that you have to submit now to the MSBA when you're, when you're starting a project. You'll, you'll get it. Uh, you'll, it. It lists, I think, 10 distinct categories of personnel, of backgrounds that they would like to see on a, um, on a school building committee. That, that's, keep going, keep going. That's it. Yeah. Uh, go up to the front. Uh, this is a two-page form, but you'll notice on the left there, uh, designation, there are a number of backgrounds that they, they would like to see and like being the strong recommendation. There's at least 10 there, uh, possibly 11. And so when we're talking about the number of people to put on a school building committee from this bylaw, uh, right now we're being, at the time, before we were doing this, it, it got to be seven and we sort of were worried, so we added two more in, ca in for uh, projects in which a state agency is um, participating in the funding, primarily schools. Uh, doesn't mean it couldn't happen with libraries, couldn't happen with something else. Um, but we, we were worried that we didn't, if we structured the bylaw such that we didn't have enough people, we might not be able to uh, satisfy the state. So we put in the uh, idea there that um, the, uh, if they shall serve uh, subject to participant requirements of a state funding authority, uh, they may appoint additional associate members to the PBC for that particular project, provided, however, that the aggregate number uh, does not exceed nine. Why nine? Um, we didn't want a sponsoring agency to be able to essentially pack a, a building committee with enough members to outvote the permanent building committee members. So that's why we limited it to nine. It would, they'd never, never have a majority more than uh, the permanent building committee members. Um, that being said, uh, in talking with the, um, the lawyer from the MSBA, she said that there is a category, let's go back, look on the right, says voting member, question mark. They will accept uh, members on there who are essentially advisory, who do not have the full voting rights. So based on that, uh, and, and my abstention, I am, as a town meeting member, going to offer an amendment to uh, be able to cover this in case we want to have more than nine to satisfy the MSBA requirements, but um, they don't want, we don't want to have them be, you know, again, hold that, that limit of voting members to nine. And um, if I may now, that's the end of my presentation, but I will now put on my town meeting member head, Jeff Strubel, Precinct 7. Okay, just before you do that, I'm going to take the, the Finance Committee report, which okay. I don't think we've heard from yet. Do we have a Finance Committee report? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town meeting members, 
At our meeting of December 8th, 2014, Finance Committee recommended the article by a vote of 8-0-0. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LaLasha first, then we'll come back to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, for those of you that picked up a handout last night or tonight about the motions, I just want to make sure you see one thing. Um, due to my error, the uh, warrant report article was incorrect compared to what the building committee, uh, what the bylaw committee voted. So if you see what's behind me, um, in your warrant report it says Board of Selectmen and it should say appointing authority, I think, or appointment, appointment committee. So I just want to make sure you understand that's the default motion that's on the floor. Mr. Struble. Thank you, Bob. That was one of my protests. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I would like to make an amendment that would uh, allow advisory members on the uh, building committee, a school, any, on a school building committee. Again, it's couched under this uh, provision if required by a co-sponsoring a, a, a co state agency, you, will have, you, may, uh, you may appoint a different, uh, additional members. And do you have that? I have that. No, this one with the red. I have it handed out to me. Oh, apparently you have it handed out. Be nice to see it in red, though. Uh, anyway, the changes I would I'm proposing as an amendment is that in that statement, um, in the middle, in the event that a particular project is subject to participant requirements, participant requirements of a state funding authority, the appointment committee may appoint additional members, uh, not associate members necessarily, but members. Um, to the PBC for that particular project, provided, however, that in no event shall the aggregate number of permanent and associate members with full voting rights, which is the ad uh, addition I'm putting in there, for a particular project exceed nine. So what that does is allows more members uh, than nine, but only nine shall have full voting rights. Um, you'll find, uh, you'll find when we get to, cha to the charter, um, there is, now a definition of associate members um, for, for appointed committees, uh, which is different from this, but keep, just wait, wait until chapter 415 for that and you'll see that this is still okay. But the, um, the amendment essentially allows the appointment of additional members unlimited in number, but that uh, the aggregate number of permanent and previously defined associate members, the first sentence up there, Hold on a bit. Yeah. No, uh, next one. The defined. Scroll, scroll up a bit. Okay. Oh yeah. Wait, where it says um, associate members, associate members, capital A, capital M, um, shall have the same participation and voting rights as permanent members. Um, the reason I'm using lowercase members in the amendment is so that it makes a distinction between members and associate members. Associate members have a sort of distinct definition contained within the bylaw. Members can be advisory and uh, can be more, I mean, by, by not excluding the number, not, not prohibiting the number, you can have more than nine, but only nine can have votes. So that's, the reason I'm doing that is so that in case the MSBA wants more people on it to fill their categories, they can be non-voting and we'd satisfy them, uh, but still satisfy our bylaw. And that's the reason I'm making the amendment. So, First of all, do we have a second on the amendment? Second, thank you. Um, I think in this case, like with last night, I will allow uh, discussion on both. Yeah, I, I, I would hope so. but. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's the end of the presentation formally, and uh, okay. questions? Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Crook? Oh, bylaw report, okay. Stephen Crook, Chair of the Bylaw Committee. At our meeting of December 22nd, we voted 5-0-0 to recommend Mr. Struble's amendment to our original article. Thank you. Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Bill Brown, Precinct 8. I'd like to offer a couple amendments, please. Um, striking the word associate and put in the word temporary in all places. Okay. 
take a quick <laughs> quick recess here for a second. Yeah. Uh, I know of at least one more. Uh, and then uh, just in all places. There's only going to be two, Bob. Thank you. Okay. So you've asked uh, strike associate and make it temporary, just you say? Yes. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Mr. Brown? Uh, the reason I think it's better temporary, quite frankly, uh, the previous speaker just mentioned that in the charter we're proposing an associate member, and I think it would take the confusion out of the two. Uh, and I've looked at several other building committees, and they use the word temporary. I looked up the word associate in the, cha in the uh, dictionary, and you could be associate forever uh, as far as that's concerned. So that was my reason for that. The second amendment, sir, would be on the second line of the second paragraph where it says design, construction, management, and financing. Uh, I th I'd like to put an and or financing of commercial and so forth. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Brown? Yeah, and, and the reason for doing so, I think, as I read it, the way it's written, um, you want somebody with design, construction, and financing. I think you mean they could be either one or the other. I don't th think anybody that's in the construction may, may not know about financing of the project. And that's the reason I think it, it clarifies that. And then uh, one additional one is on the next to last paragraph where it says within seven calendar days. Could I suggest we make that eight? So again, it doesn't run into confusion with the charter because the charter says seven days or less uh, is, count, you know, is every, uh, whatever it is. But uh, this would make it calendar days, and I think that's what the intent is. And I don't think it would hurt the thing one more day. It actually speeds it up. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. Further discussion? Thank you. Oh, Mr. Struble first? No. Back to just, just to respond to, to those, um, as far as difference between associate and temporary, uh, a Rose Bay under any other name, as far as I'm concerned, but um, other, other towns have used other names, um, and I understand the desire to avoid confusion with Chapter 415, I think, of, of the Charter, but there is a provision in 415 of the Charter which allows that uh, the uh, voting uh, permission for uh, associate members is uh, can be set by a bylaw, not just the charter. So there's no real. And I, I granted it's confusing semantically, but I don't think uh, legislatively there's any confusion um, regarding uh, the and or. Uh, I can't see any any harm in that. Uh, and as far as uh, the seven or eight days. Uh, since, yes, the, the charter is now being upgraded, perhaps this should go as well. It does, it, the length of time is, is somewhat arbitrary, only in the fact that we wanted to get it within the, the, a unit of, of time that was, uh, I guess, available for someone to work into their schedule to give someone a call. So. Mr. Berman? Thank you, Mr. Can you hear me? Is this on? It's on. I just wasn't speaking loud enough. Thank you, Mr. Moderator um, and town meeting members. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Um, I'd like to first start off by thanking uh, the bylaw committee for uh, what was really uh, a, a, ta a laborious process of researching other permanent building committee uh, statutes and bylaws throughout the Commonwealth. Um, I can tell you it took me about a half an hour to write the instructional motion, and it took them about six months to go through and actually craft the bylaw. So I really, kudos to the, to the bylaw committee for really putting the time and effort and really starting from scratch and coming up with what I think is a, is, is a very, very good bylaw for us to consider. Um, the history of why we're here, uh, Mr. Schubel pointed out, was it, it, was, it was just about a year ago, it was February of 2014, after we ended the special town meeting that came to allocate more funds for the library that many of us um, 
kind of frustrated by that process, um, where I, uh, where I authored and town meeting overwhelmingly uh, supported creating a permanent building committee um, for how we're going to operate uh, buildings in town. The largest expenditure of money, uh, resources, volunteer hours, staff time, community capital, is when a town undertakes a new building or a major renovation of an existing building. And one thing that I learned uh, while serving on the Finance Committee is that we're never going to have enough money to build the kind of things we want to build or spend the money on the things that we really want to spend on. But if the lack of money is sort of public enemy number one in terms of building the kinds of things that we want to do, public enemy number two is time. And time lost for when we don't get information right, uh, it creates frustration, it creates uh, costing additional cost overruns, um, it causes doubts, and just adds to the timing and the, and the process. Um, we have volunteer experts serving on a number of standing committees in town. The Zoning Board of Appeals has real estate attorneys. CPDC has um, planners. Uh, the Board of Health has folks who, who are nurses and people who have worked in that field. Even on Finance Committee, we have a couple of people who know our way around a balance sheet. Why not a standing committee in town um, of experts who are going to steer and oversee our most precious town ass assets, which are our buildings? Um, it's time has come to implement this. What will the building permanent building committee do? One of the things that's important, I think that was also stressed, uh, some of the frustration that people had in, in doing other buildings, is that before a project is going to come to town meeting and ask you for financing, for financing of a project, whether it be feasibility or actual expenditure of funds, it's going to be fully vetted for its feasibility. Um, it's going to increase the transparency. It's going to give you town meeting members confidence that the data that you have is fully vetted as most as it possibly can so that we get it right, so that we don't lose time, we don't lose money, and we don't lose momentum. Another thing that's really important about having a permanent building committee, and Mr. Struble alluded to this too, uh, is not just when we take on new projects, but also to take care of the projects that we already have. The last paragraph of the bylaw states that the permanent building committee will do an, an annual inventory of the condition of our, of our buildings. And one of the important reasons for having that is that um, we have a very, very stretched capital budget. If we know the condition of our buildings, if we know what's coming next, if we know what are the things that we're going to have to spend on, we can basically allocate our resources in a more constructive way. We can, be, we can plan ahead, and I know we have a 10-year capital plan, but having, having a, a, a standing committee of expert volunteers who are going to look at that as their job, um, or one of their missions, is really going to help us spend money in a, in, in a much more feasible way. Um, as Mr. Struble said, we're not the first town, we're not, we're not taking this on as a town that no one else has done it. Many, many, many towns have permanent building committees, and as Mr. Struble said, some of them actually really run the show. We're fortunate we have a facilities department that's very, very good. The permanent building committee doesn't have to get as involved as those other towns. I know we've, it's been discussed here in town. Um, many, you know, many years ago, it never got implemented, but I really do think uh, that its time has come. Um, this thing has been vetted by some of the other stakeholders in town. I know it's been looked at by the library folks. I know the schools have looked at this. Uh, one of the things that the Permanent Building Committee is not going to do is that it's not going to overstep the boundaries of those folks who are already working on these things, but it's going to help craft and steer these projects to completion. I don't want people to think that creating a Permanent Building Committee is a knock on the way things have been done in the past. We're standing in a beautiful building that was built without a Permanent Building Committee. We've gotten it, we've gotten things done in the past. But one of the things that we're going to see in the, in the, as we do the charter, and that the uh, charter committee was very, very uh, smart in putting in, is that they put in a clause, and you'll see it later, that basically says every 10 years, the bylaw committee, they're going to look at doing the bylaws again. Because things change. Government changes. Regulations change. Doing business changes. We debated a, a motion last night on a bylaw that was done in 1956, which clearly you can argue one way or another, but it's, it, it, it doesn't really suit today's purposes. Looking at these things 
again, under a fresh light, under new conditions, we're going to find that the way we did business in the past, while it got us, while it served us well, may not be the way we want to do business in the future. And having a permanent building committee uh, is a way to start, uh, and it will enable us to really marshal our resources, spend our money more wisely, and gain the trust and confidence of town as we go forward on building and maintaining our projects. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, I have no problem in any of the three or four uh, uh, motions that were made to amend this. I think they're all fine. Thank you. For the discussion, Mr. Arena. Good evening, town meeting members. John Arena, Precinct 1. Um, I support the intent and the language in the article and the proposed amendments. I do have a question about the third paragraph. I'd be curious to hear from the building, the bylaw committee if, if a circumstance occurred where there were two simultaneous uh, projects running concurrently. The language is written here seems to suggest that the permanent members would be part of both groups and there'd be a separate and distinct group of associate members for projects A and B and therefore the total number of, if you will, permanent associate members could exceed nine, although no more than nine on a particular project. Is that the intended way that that's written to comprehend more than one project? Very good. Thank you. The answer was yes. Yeah. Further discussion? Yes, right in the middle. Uh, David Zeke, Precinct 1. I have a couple questions. One is, um, what is the term of these permanent members? What's the length of the term? Mr. Struble? Um, there, it's three years, and they will start off um, with the, the, the five permanent members will start off with uh, one, uh, I think one with one, two with two, um, yeah, two whatever. Two with three, so they would, they would, they would overlap as their, their terms would expire. But, so, where does that come from? That's not spelled out in this. this uh, or is it charter or bylaw? There, there is. Three I think years. I think it's in the charter that uh, appointed members are terms for three years unless otherwise specified. And that but was my other question. These are appointed members. In, yes, there's in an the appointing committee three, three. made up of the chair of the selectmen, okay. chair of the school committee, and the moderator. Appointed by whom? Elected by <laughs> the. So the the there's appointed the uh, there is an appointing committee. Uh, where is it? End of the first paragraph, uh, shall be appointed by an appointment committee consisting of the chair of the board of selectmen, the chair of the school committee, and the town moderator. All right. And, the, and I'm sorry, and, and the, the term comes from somewhere else in the charter? It's, it's a, unless, I, I, I wish I, I should know this, but I, I don't know exactly where I've seen, I, I know I've seen it. It'll probably come up while we're doing the charter uh, review, but uh, there is a provision for appointed member, appointed uh, committee members' terms are three years unless otherwise specified. Okay, because I noticed in the new charter uh, or the, the revised charter that it, it spells it out for each each board. We'll, we'll say three year term. I, I'll have to say we'll have to research that and get back to you. But I'm, I'm I I know that the subject came up when we were doing this, and we thought that the either the the bylaw or the charter provision would cover the terms. We have no intention of changing that. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greenfield, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hotzler? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Glenn Hartzler, Precinct 4. Uh, will you take another amendment uh, right now? We're, normally we wouldn't, but I, I know what your amendment is, and it seems to be fairly straightforward, and we have a copy of it, so I will. In this okay, case. thank you. Move to amend the proposed section 3.3.6 of the Reading General Bylaw by striking the characters oh, open parenthesis P, B, C, close parenthesis in the first paragraph thereof, and by replacing all occurrences therein of the letters P, B, C with the words permanent building committee, and to a further amend said proposed section by striking the characters open parenthesis, MEP, close parenthesis, in the second paragraph thereof. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Hatzler? Basically, uh, most of the other sections in the bylaw and in the charter have all words uh, spelled out for committees. Um, no abbreviations uh, are used, and 
I recommend that we do that in this particular bylaw as well. For further discussion, Mr. Struble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moder. Um, since three of the members of the bylaw committee are on the Charter Review Committee, um, we'd be hard pressed to disagree with them. <laughs> Further discussion, Mr. Greenfield. Uh, just a question about the, uh, if I understand, the uh, you'll have a sponsoring group, uh, uh, David Greenfield. Field Precinct Five. Um, you'll have a sponsoring group. Um, they'll put a lot of work into what they need in design of a building. Um, it'll go to committee. The sponsoring group is then not the decider. The committee is. Um, is there? Uh, it, it is is my understanding correct? There. Well, I think it's in the. Um One, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, it says the PBC Permanent Building Committee uh, shall work with the school committee, the board of selectmen, and any, spon any other sponsoring agency. It's not that they will take over, that they will work with them. They are essentially managerial and facilitators, not uh, commanders, shall we say. They will work I, I with I them. I understand, work with, um, but, the, but the authority nevertheless exists for them to go counter to the sponsor by their votes, yes. And is there, it, it, does it end there, or is there, is there any, any path for uh, the sponsor who, y you know, the, the disagreements that might arise, is there a path <laughs> for resolving those, or is, it, or is it strictly within the committee? I would assume it would be uh, try again and uh, discuss what w went wrong the first time and see if you can find a way of compromise. It's not meant to be prohibitive. Right. As, uh, you could always try again, I would assume. And, and, and in that being the case, will the committee be that intimately involved in understanding the needs that the sponsor, will they be involved early so that they actually understand the depth of the needs that that design was about? Or will they pick it up you know, par I, I'm trying to understand how the, the flow. It's, it's intended that the building committee be at least alerted to and hopefully involved almost as soon as the idea occurs to the sponsoring agency. That's what the seven, eight, eight day uh, limit is for. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't essentially codify how it does it. It's meant to essentially e to bring them in as uh, participants and help, I guess the word is facilitate um, getting that project from the sponsoring agency um, to this body for, for a vote, going through whatever channels it has to go through, finance committee and so forth. All right. um, I, I can't, uh, having, you know, I, that's where I think your other towns probably would, would put this in chapter and verse, and say that this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. I think this, this particular building committee is going to have to evolve. Right, I understand. So, so this ends up being a little bit like Congress, uh, which is, um, the appeal is the is to try to go to town meeting and block the funding, <laughs> block the funding, uh, if you will, it, if there if there was a disagreement. Um, I have to repeat that. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, it, it, it's uh, thank you. That that's helpful. Okay. Further discussion, Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, bylaw committee. To uh, prior speaker's question, 3.3.1.5 um, of the Reading Bylaw, term of office. The term of office of each member of boards, committees, and commissions shall com commence on July 1 of the year of appointment, shall expire upon June 30 of the third following calendar year, except for terms of the members of the Reading Housing Authority, which are for five years. So that's where the three years is found. Further discussion? Doug Webb, Precinct 1. Um, is the term permanent mem members used in the other committees and stuff? I'm a little confused between permanent and temporary members. 
because they're all temporary members as far as I can tell if their terms are only three years. So I'm against the use of the word temporary in replacement of associate and uh, if somebody could clarify if the word permanent is used because you've used it in two different meanings here in this in the first paragraph permanent building committee is a building committee forever but permanent members are not uh, understood but that is we have seen it permanent in other co other communities and the reason it's called permanent building committee is that's what the instruction of motion wanted it to be called so I agree there's probably some uh, confusion there, but um, I'm not sure it will necessarily lead to uh, problems. Town Council, I, I can't imagine it. But. Rhetorical question. So noted, I guess, I have to say. I'm sorry. Mr. Mon? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Just to follow up on Mr. Greenfield's question. If we take this high school as a example, hypothetical example, uh, towards the end of design or, and cost estimating, it turned out it was over budget, and the decision was either the cross field or the lighting on the football field had to be eliminated. As I understand this, it would be up to the permanent building committee to decide which of those two structures or facilities or amenities would be eliminated in order to come in within budget. Is that the intent? Yes, it's, um, it's not just the, per the permanent building committee, which at that point, which you're describing, would it also include the associate members from the school committee in that case, and possibly more than two, depending on what the, uh, what the funding requirements were. So the answer is yes. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Hansen, Precinct 7. Uh, the $2 million seems a little high to me, but I was wondering, for the other towns that you reviewed, was there a discretionary component to invoking uh, the Permanent Building Committee? Say a project comes in at $1.5 million, but there's, it's a unique project. Maybe we need some certain expertise. Um, I, I can't say for sure whether or not I, I saw that codified. In, the, in their bylaws, I would imagine, let, let's take Reading for example, if something came in under two million and that sponsoring agency still wanted the um, expertise, if you will, of the build permanent building committee, I don't see why they couldn't ask for it. Okay. Um, and just to your point about the two million being too high, um, it was recommended to me by another uh, town permanent building committee member that uh, that two million threshold, uh, there is a precedent in uh, state funding projects for DCAM projects, wherein at 1.5 million, you are required to have an owner's project manager. And that's in chapter, in, uh, that's in a chapter and verse. He suggested when I was s s expressing, I guess, uh, you know, concern about how do we decide that threshold, he suggested that as, as a precedent to follow perhaps. So if you're thinking of 2 million as being too high, 1.5 would be more in line with what the state does. Okay, great, that's helpful. And just, w I wanted to just clarify one thing you said. Does this allow us to have discretion? So if there was a project that we wanted to invoke the PVC, w we could? I will throw that to town council. I don't see why it wouldn't, um, if, if someone asked the question. I, I, I'd be in support of that, that's okay, why I thanks. asked. Mr. Miyagi. I could short circuit the whole meeting. Um, as written, the bylaw says they, ha they shall have jurisdiction over projects that are more than two million. I don't see any reason why, if everyone agrees, that, uh, that they shouldn't have, uh, be allowed to uh, uh, provide their services for a project that is less than two million if the sponsoring agency goes along with that. I think that's um, perfectly acceptable. Okay, great, thank you. Further discussion, Mr. Graham? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Russ Graham, Precinct 4. Whenever the term building committee is meeting, there's an automatic reflex in my brain that says I have to speak. Uh, my first experience with any discussion about building committees was in 1981 when I attended on behalf of the wedding 
the Massachusetts Association of Finance Committee, and the whole discussion was about the need for towns to begin to have building committees. The original discussion centered around Prop 2 and a half actually took place in the legislature before citizens for limited taxation took it over. Uh, the legislature, as is its wont, was deliberative and slow, but one of its members was our former state representative from Reading, uh, who was very much involved in that. And their whole idea was that no matter what you did, you would exempt from the restriction on taxes capital projects. Because if you began to say that you were going to buy your operating against your capital, you were going to decide not to do things that you absolutely knew you had to do. And that's exactly what happened. We did not do that, and I think since then it has probably come up at least three times at the town meeting, and we still have not acted on it. As a result, going back to the original old library, going back to the fire station, going back to the Board of Public Works, going back to the Senior Center, and moving on to the schools. We never initiated anything. We never really decided to oversee anything. We responded, and that's a not a good way to manage. We ought to be on top of these things. We ought to do exactly what is spelled out uh, in this bylaw, because it's a very serious project. I have to remind you that the school projects alone were over $100 million. The state paid for a good portion of them, we're happy to say, but nonetheless, that's a lot of money to come about to respond to problems rather than look for problems that ought to be addressed. And we were going to address them. We're not sending kids to schools in February when the boilers go. We're going to do something about it. I think this bylaw does exactly that, and I would hope we get overwhelming approval of it, and I'm delighted to finally see it come uh, more in favor than it certainly was before, before this body. Thank you. Further discussion? Well, people that have not spoken? Mr. Barnes? Thank you, Mr. Mahler. Uh, Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Uh, to the point about the um, $2 million threshold, and I certainly don't have a strong feeling um, or knowledge or expertise as to whether or not that should be higher or, or you know, more appropriately lower, um, but I would say this and defer to, to town council. Um, notwithstanding the fact that it would be possible to invoke the consultation of the permanent <coughs> building committee for projects that were less than uh, aggregate um, $2 million. As I, as I read that, it, it indicates that the Permanent Building Committee uh, has responsibility for the oversight for projects over $2 million. So I just raise for, uh, for everyone's consideration, if the thought is that the committee should be consulted and involved uh, at projects lower than that, which may make some sense, Perhaps there ought to be some discussion or some thought put into who would ultimately have responsibility so there isn't a, a conflict or tension. Thank you. Mr. Malacca. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, when I saw the first draft of 350000 I did the most sensible thing I could think of, which is look at the capital plan, and I saw how many times these folks would be meeting. And I said 350000 is too too low. Um, quite simply, $2 million was a convenient figure because the biggest capital project that met the definition um, was just over a million and a half, was a million six for one of the school groups. And it was pretty clear to me, after a discussion with the superintendent of schools, that we didn't need a building committee to discuss school groups. So the thinking all along has been the word shall is important. At, one, at what level must they be involved? Well, $2 million was a convenient figure. Um, there was never any doubt that if this resource exists, as I hope it will, they could be available for any number of things of any size. But shall was the important word. If you're going to invoke the building committee and they must be in charge, we don't want them to be in charge of a, of a typical roofing project for, 
you know, for a school. Further discussion? Mr. Dean, please. David Green, Greenfield, Precinct 5. Um, so I, uh, I read, or if I understand, uh, a project that is below two million is not your responsibility, it's not the, it's not the new committee's responsibility, therefore it's not under their authority, therefore whoever sponsors it would remain responsible for that project. They can seek your advice, the experience, benefit by it, but even though it's not explicitly written, to me it's clear that the authority remains with the party. Is that, yes. so I, I find that to be beneficial. Um, that, that allows it to, um, I, I agree, I don't, think, um, I don't think the committee needs to be brought in on every small project, but to have the benefit of the expertise is good. But, it, but I think it is clear, it, at least it's clear to me, that the authority and responsibility remains with the sponsor of the party. Correct. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? We'll now take on the um, several amendments we have. We'll start with the, the first one, Mr. Struble's amendment. Do we have that up on the screen? It's in red, okay. All those in favor of the, the um, proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. The, ne the next one is in the is that Mr. Brown's uh, is associate versus temporary? Okay, the associate versus temporary in green, okay. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Right, okay, we also had the and or too. Um, Replacing the word and with and or. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. The next is replacing seven with eight. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. And the last one is Mr. Hartzler replacing the initials um, PBC with uh, permanent building committee. Do we have that up there? Yes. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. And now we will uh, vote on the, the motion as amended. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 7, the uh, motion is made by um, Mr. Cresino. And I will begin by giving a report by the, of the Charter Commission. Is there a second? The Reading Home Rule Charter, which established the framework of Reading's current government structure, was written by a charter commission created by and elected by the voters of Reading. It went into effect in July 1986. Ten years ago, a charter review committee was established to examine the workings of the charter and to recommend, if necessary, changes to keep up with the times. At the 2013 annual town meeting, via an instructional motion, a new group was established to once again review and recommend. By vote of town meeting, the moderator was appointed chairman and he appointed the rest of the committee, choosing people from all precincts of the town. Committee members are Steve Crook, Peg Russell, Paul Sylvester, Richard Coco, Phil Pacino, Phil Rushworth, John Segala, Carolyn Whiting, John Carpenter, Jeff Struble, Bill Brown, Janice Jones, and Glenn Hartzler. In addition to a geographical spread, the committee contained two members of the original Charter Commission, the former and current chairs of the bylaw committee, and other members of the bylaw committee, as well as former and current elected officials. The purpose of the committee, as stated in the motion that created it, is to report its findings and recommendations to town meeting. Tonight, we do that. Because of the unique situation of having a committee making a presentation to town meeting chaired by the moderator, I treated myself as that committee's moderator rather than chairman, removing myself from most of the deliberations and instead moderating the meetings. Exceptions to that included issues directly concerning town meeting or the moderator's position where I felt I had unique insight. The first meeting was held on September 19, 2013. Since then, the committee has met and deliberated 25 times. We had two town-wide public forums to solicit opinions of the committee's work from appointed and elected officials, town employees, and the general public. We received considerable input and assistance from the town manager, the town council, and the town clerk. 
For the most part, the proposals are not substantial changes, but rather are of a clarifying nature. One notable exception is a proposed change in the way members of the Board of Assessors are chosen. We also propose the removal of Charter Article 9 and parts of Charter Article 6, which were transitional sections dealing with the original implementation of the Charter in 1986. The committee felt that they were no longer necessary and only made the document more difficult to read. You'll hear more about those proposed changes when we get to those sections in our deliberations. Tonight, the motion was made by a, a member of the committee. Explanations from the town manager and or the town council and more detailed descriptions of the various proposals by members of the committee. We'll proceed through the motion much as we do with the annual budget. We'll review the document and propose changes, charter article by charter article, starting with the preamble and then one through eight, with discussions and proposed amendments on those particular sections before moving on to the next piece. Aside from proposed amendments, which we will act on as they are made, and incidental motions, we will only vote once on the entire proposed amended charter, either as proposed or as amended by this body. The charter changes are covered in two town meeting articles, seven and eight. We'll allow discussion on both at the same time. As you will probably hear from town council, the reason it's split into two separate articles is because of a state law that restricts charter changes dealing with the terms of office of the board of selectmen, town meeting, or the town manager being made by town meeting. Instead, they must be done through the creation and election of a charter commission, then go to the ballot, or in cases where the changes are slight, the town meeting can vote to send the changes to the legislature for approval. That is the purpose of Warrant Article 8. With that, we will begin, I believe, Mr. Lasher will start. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Alan has covered the background quite well. I'll just have a couple of small additions before turning over to other committee members. Um, I want to mention as, as an outsider that joined the group somewhere about halfway through, um, the first thing I noticed was the extreme diverse group that we had. I don't believe there was a single unanimous vote except to adjourn the whole time. Um, so to the extent that uh, you know, dialogue and discussion and debate is a good thing, it was very healthy. Um, there were many, many very diverse opinions expressed and views considered. Um, and as a result, I think the only thing they're unanimous on now is this is a better product than what we started with. Um, my role um, was helpful in the sense that I did join them part way and I asked uh, uh, what I've described here as a lot of annoying questions. Um, some of you know me well enough to know that I don't assume things. I assume the king doesn't have any clothes if I don't see any clothes. So I asked a lot of questions about why does it say this in the charter? Um, and in, in many instances, it was explained to me, and it was, it was a lot of good background and history. I, I really learned a lot about the history of the town. But there were some instances where people just couldn't answer the question, and so those sections were removed. Um, so what is left is a document that looks forward more than backwards, and I think that's an important distinction. Um, some of the themes um, is somewhat similar to the zoning project, not, not meaning to horrify you. Um, <laughs> But modernize. Again, this charter was formed over 25 years ago, and just think about society and how different things are in 25 years, let alone the town of Reading. Um, at that point, especially, the transition to a centralized or a more centralized form of government was quite a change. And so there were a lot of little tidbits left in the charter, meant almost as a tip of the cap to some of the old power structures, the old elected boards and committees, such as public works, saying, we understand you, we're still recognizing you, this is how things work now. Um, I and, and the Charter Committee later agreed there was really no need to have that sort of historical reference. We're well past that now. Um, the other thing I, I want to tip my cap to uh, Town Council did an outstanding job streamlining this document and making it internally very consistent. Um, the zoning bylaw was much more technically challenging and still is. Um, but this was not easy, and the, the map that uh, the moderator laid out was, was very complex in terms of there's two types of things that we're discussing, things that can be decided by town meeting and then local voters, and other things that have to be decided by town meeting, then the state legislature, and then there's a possibility the state legislator may ask the voters to approve <coughs> that also. So we had quite a try and try to formulate how many articles, what's the timing, how do we ask the state to do what. 
again, I want to make sure during the presentation you see all your fellow town meeting members that did put in a lot of hard work for this. And at this point, I'll turn it over the first part of the discussion. Let me give you a little bit of an outline. As, uh, as the moderator mentioned, we're going to go through a new article at a time, and I'll show you another slide quickly. Um, Phil Pacino will cover articles one, two, and three. Bill Brown will, will do articles four and five, and Jeff Struve will do articles six, seven, and eight. And let me just leave as background, and we have lots of resources as you need them, um, an outline of what the new charter looks like. Thank you. Before we begin, we'll uh, get a couple of reports. First, the bylaw committee report, Mr. Clark. <coughs> Stephen Crook, chair of the bylaw committee, also a member of the charter committee. At our meeting of December 8th, 2014, the bylaw committee voted to recommend this article by a vote of 4-0-0. That's Article 7. Likewise, at our, our meeting of December 8th, we voted 4-0-0 to recommend Article 8. Thank you. FinCom report. Do we have a FinCom report? No FinCom report. Okay. Mr. Pacino. Oh, I'm sorry. Does Selectman have a report? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <coughs> Phil Pacino, Precinct 5, and a member of the Charter Committee, and also the former chairman for life of the Bylaw Committee. <laughs> I can't resist, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm covering the preamble on Articles 1, 2, and 3. Uh, just quickly on the preamble, the only, and I'm going to just give you the highlights of what each of us is going to do. Uh, in terms of the preamble, the only thing that we've added is the word where it says Commonwealth, they've added Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Is there any discussion? None appearing. We will move on to the Charter Article 1. Okay. In Charter Article 1, uh, just covering the, the highlights, uh, we had the old Article 1-2. Uh, that has uh, basically been moved to the definition section and uh, where that is now, and we've renumbered the sections. Uh, 1.2 is just rewording. 1, 3, and 1, 4, uh, there are no changes. 1, 5, the change is that in terms of entering into contracts, agreements, we've just clarified the Board of Selectmen's uh, role in that. In 1, 6, we've moved definitions to 1, 6. We've added the generic term uh, boards and committees. Uh, we've changed, basically, uh, we talk about a local newspaper, we've actually updated, we've made that more current by calling it local news media. Uh, we've eliminated, there's a reference to a bulletin board. In today's world, I don't know if any people read, you know, go to bulletin boards, so we, we've replaced that with local news media. And then we've clarified, we haven't really changed, but we've clarified the uh, definition majority vote. If it's a committee of a town meeting, or a town meeting, a committee of town meeting, or a precinct meeting, a majority vote is defined as just the members of present, present all other committees, the majority vote is considered a majority of the members of the committee. Is there any discussion on section one? Mr. Mon? Jamie Mon, uh, Precinct 4, just a clarification. The quorum on other commissions, you said it's just a majority of the members, but it's actually a majority of the number of authorized positions on that commission right. or committee. Right, that's, I, was, um, I define members as the same thing with that, yeah. Yes, Mr. Barnes. Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Um, in light of the discussion uh, about the associate members, um, and perhaps this may just be my ignorance, but if there are associate members who have voting rights, um, are they distinguished in terms of the, uh, the, the, the term of majority? How, how, does, uh, how does that factor in? Well, uh, that's going to be covered later, but I can quickly, basically in terms of the associate membership, and I may be speaking, Mr. I may be stealing Mr. Brown's thunder here. I'm sorry, Mr. Bill, if I do. <laughs> uh, in terms of the associate membership, we kind of left the rules and regulations to be determined by the appointing authority in that case. Uh, and we see that the committee basically saw that as, as being a, a limit, associate membership 
other than the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is set by statute by uh, state law, would be something that would be a very limited type of situation. And it would be very much set by what the rules and regulations would be set by the appointing authority in terms of that. So uh, thank you. And, and, and I guess in the, in the spirit of full disclosure, I, I, I am also a, an associate member of the Historical Commission, uh, not a voting uh, member. But that then would mean, would it not, that, that be, because associate members are appointed by the appointing authority, Mm. Uh, that the majority would include the associate members, right? Well, in, in no, in this case, you know, the way it would be set up would be the voting members, be the voting members. We, we visualize that the uh, associate members would only step up in certain limited instances. The um, particular instance that we talked about was the demolition bylaw, where there was a meeting, where there was a, a, a meeting, what if that meeting, there had not been an, a quorum present at that point? We visualize that as the situation where the member would step up in that case. Other than that, it would not be considered, it would not, the majority would only be the majority of the voting members themselves. Okay, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but it, but it would be possible. I know like, for example, in the ZBA, associate members only vote in the absence of the, of the member. But as I understand all of this, that isn't necessarily a, an express limitation of associate members. In other words, associate members might be able to be participating voting members. I'm just trying to clarify that um, going forward. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. For I might also steal Mr. Brown's thunder. Uh, um, you see behind me section 4.15. What it generally says is um, the exact definition of associate membership is to be determined. The, the Charter Committee was very clear. They wanted to leave that up to the appointing authority to suggest to this bo body a bylaw that would then exactly describe the terms and conditions of an associate membership of their committee, and presumably the Board of Selectmen will aggregate a lot of board's thoughts. Mr. Barnes? I, I simply wanted to, to comment that I, it was not my intention that anybody uh, should, nor would it be my thought that anybody could steal Mr. Brown's thunder. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Further discussion? Section 1. Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I have a question on the definition uh, being changed for local newspaper to local news medium and where it's changed to a newspaper or other means or channel of information communication to which the general public has access. What is that going to be considered? What that, mean, what that means is basically the committee, in terms of coming sort of either a website, either some other way of getting there, and who knows what uh, we're trying to provide for something in the future as to what technology may develop in terms of notification. What? Uh, what if there'll be a newspaper, right. Okay. Well, I want to make sure that whatever, I, I remember seeing this throughout, you know, um, the revisions here, and I forget all the places that it occurred, but my preference is to continue, even if we do put it on the website, is to continue to put it in the newspaper. Um, I don't see going exclusively to website for any notice. One, it's too hard to find. There's too many different parts. It's easy for me to find whatever public notice, um, no matter what committee, if it's in the newspaper, I see it. I'm not searching through the website. I don't go to the town website unless I'm looking for something specific. Um, so I think um, I want to be assured that we're not giving up publicizing what we need to publicize in the Daily Chronicle. No, I know. no it, the intent is still to leave it as published in the newspaper. It now, is. I, and know, add on these other sources. Right, and other sources. Now, you know, in all truthfulness, if, if you know the uh, newspaper business, uh, they're not doing well right now. And so there is some concern about whether newspapers may exist. There are many newspapers that have just gone totally online. They no longer publish, and to publish a daily, a daily or a weekly. Uh, well, I'm paper. glad that we still have a, 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 an afternoon, Monday through Friday, and, and a weekly. So I think that, right. you know, um, as long as they're there, let's use them. So I would like to make an amendment um, to um, change the word. In that, let me see. How, what would we do instead of or? Um, and, well, and or still leaves it up to or, so I want to make sure that for the time being, I mean, we can change this in five years or ten years, but for the time being, I'd like to see the newspapers uh, 
included. Do we have a remark that, just one second, Mr. Bell. Because we are leaving the word, we, we are leaving the word newspaper in there already. Because um, it says the meaning a newspaper or any other form or channel. But of it's an or, so it, it gives the option. I want to make sure that the newspaper stays in and add others. We definitely have to use multiple sources of notification. Clearly, people rely on lots of different sources. Mr. Brown, do you have a point of order? I can't hear what Mr. Brown is saying. Mr. Brown, did you have a comment? Come up to the microphone. I think if you use the word may instead of shell, it'll cover what you're looking for more. May, may be a newspaper. No, I want shall and change the, keep it as that and just change or to and for the time being. You know, if they go out of business, we change it, but I'm not so sure they're going out anytime soon. So I'd like to uh, change or to and, and then we have the newspaper and websites or whatever else we want to use. Okay, do we have a second to that? Second. second? Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Crook? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll come back in. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. My concern might be that if you say a local newspaper and other means, it now obligates you to use a local newspaper and to use another means. I'm, and I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or not, but it potentially is. Um, just, just a point to consider. Mr. Meares. If the point, I, I, I need to understand what the point is, and by itself isn't going to do much for us. Um, if the point is you want a newspaper, it to be in a newspaper, and, and use another means only if the newspaper is not available, is that the point? Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. I think in this day and age, we have to have multiple ways of reaching people. And I mean, I, and it's hard to get to reach people. So I want the newspaper, you know, it's logical to include the town website. Um, so the newspaper and the website, not either exclusively, but both. So in all of, so just so you're clear, there are a number of places in the charter that require notice to be published in a local news medium. Right. You want that to mean in at least two places. What I first wanted to be assured of was that it is at least in the newspaper, but I recognize that a lot of people use the website. I, for one, and my husband prefer the newspaper to begin with, and we faithfully read that every day, as many others do. I want to maintain that right and ability to be informed via the newspaper and not have to look on the town website every day searching for I don't know where. So I want the newspaper, and if people want to keep a website in, it leave that broad term channel of information communication okay, possible. So what you want to do is you want to say shall mean both sure. a newspaper and at least one other means. That's yeah, I think that's, that's good. Point. Yep. Do you accept I think it's that practical for today. Do you accept that as your uh, proposed sure. amendment? Any Thank objection? You. None appearing. Okay. <laughs> Further discussion? Yes, Mr. McKenzie? Yes, Bruce McKenzie, um, Precinct 8, thank you. Um, I was hoping to get my comment in before hers. Um, I wanted to explicitly mention website in that definition. 
So I'd like to propose that after the and in yellow, you say comma, website, comma, or other means. Um, I think websites will be around a long time. Um, newspapers <laughs> might not be. Um, I'm not suggesting we add social media because that's still in transition. Um, okay, is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second, okay. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Dudario. Oh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, around the Dario Precinct 6. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, just a thank you to uh, you know, the committee that put this together. An awful lot of work. <coughs> well done. Uh, <clears throat> I just have a question on uh, town officer, and, uh, and I I'm okay with the way it is, but I just wanted uh, just an explanation where it, uh, it says that the term shall not include a town meeting member. So I'm not against that, but I'm just wondering if you could tell me, like, what is the thinking on why you did that? Where are you, Ron? Where are, where are uh, you? On the definition of town officer. It's the last uh, definition in my paper. Yeah. And it says that the term town officer sh shall not mean, basically, should not, shall not include a town meeting member. Uh, and as I say, I'm not, I'm not against it, but I just was wondering how, how you defined town officer, uh, and just to explain that. Mr. Well, Brown? Yeah. You want, you want it? Yeah. By state statute, a town meeting member is not an officer. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. My colleague on the uh, Charter Committee points out that is not a change from the existing charter that was there before. That's Further discussion? Was, that's what I was going to say. It's just uh, all we've done there in that particular section is just reworded the, the uh, previous charter in that. We've just changed some of the wording. Mr. LaLasher? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, one of my concerns is having language in the charter that's too specific. We don't want to have another charter committee need to be formed because there's no such thing as a newspaper. So quite honestly, I'd rather leave flexibility in the definitions and hopefully common sense. Um, there are a lot of rules and regulations beyond this charter that requires the town to publish things in, in for instance, newspapers. However, um, uh, albeit at a very slow pace, state government is changing and becoming more electronic. So I think the key to the language in the charter should be to be flexible and allow whatever changes the state may uh, put forth to us to be able to be accommodated without convening a charter committee or commission. Further discussion? None appearing. So we're ready for the vote on the two amendment, proposed amendments. First is Ms. O'Neill's amendment to, uh, on the newspaper issue. Do we have that up there? All those in favor? No? All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. The uh, second proposed amendment by Mr. McKenzie, adding website. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion does not carry. We're on to uh, Charter Article Number 2. Mr. Pazino. Charter Article Number 2, uh, just to be clear that uh, Section 2122 Two three two five two six will all be part of Article Eight. Also, just to be clear on that, uh, basically two one, it was just some uh, rewording. Uh, two two, basically the intent here was just to clarify polling locations, and also to uh, remove the Board of Assessors from this process since they really have played no role in setting the, uh, the, the voting precincts, but just clarifying what's actually in place. 2-3 uh, was just changing the, uh, the, there's a tiebreaker at the town meeting member right now, and it, that would go the, to the ballot position, and we changed that to send that to the precinct, precinct vote. 
Uh, two four did not did not change. Two five, we changed the deadline on the nomination papers from 28 days to 35 days, and that conforms to state law. Uh, two six, we removed the uh, failure to take the the oath of oath of office. Uh, we also move that if a member uh, moves from to another district, they're allowed to continue to sit in their seat and serve in this town meeting for the next election. And tie votes, uh, we basically took that out because that is redundant. That is now covered up above under 2-3. 2-7 uh, is a, a new section that was added that really is just to clarify the conduct of the precinct meeting. Uh, two eight did not change. Two nine did not change. Uh, two ten, the old uh, two ten was eliminated, and because that was uh, considered not necessary. Uh, two eleven did not change. Uh, what we did in two twelve, the first part of two twelve, is we uh, made town meeting committees subject to open meeting law. In two twelve point one. Uh, we get in some substantial changes here. Uh, one of the issues that we were asked to look at is the finance committee term. Uh, if your first term is a shortened term because you're appointed to an un to a uh, open seat, the question would come up, uh, you know, would that count against your three three term? And basically, we said that if the term is less than two years remaining, that would not count toward that three year term. Uh, in we also in that section, uh, we changed the, um, the um, uh, we also changed the notice period change. The report submission now would be instead of seven days would be a reasonable effort. In uh, two twelve point two, uh, one of the issues here that the committee discussed was in terms of the zoning bylaws. Uh, there is a lot of review that goes uh, into that by various committees. Uh, the question came up is, you know, should the uh, bylaw committee play a part in that, make some sort of recommendation? The committee's, uh, again, was the conclusion was that it, it may consider it, possibly may consider it. It's not required to, but it may, if they feel that it is not covered by any other, any in by other people in this. Uh, two dash uh, twelve point three is just uh, changing the report report from time to time. Uh, again, in two thirteen, we removed the reference to bulletin board. Uh, the change the number we all in two fourteen two thirteen, we changed the number of uh, to call the special town meeting, and that's in two fourteen. Uh, the in two fourteen, the change was to. Uh, just have the RMLD budget, which is not adopted by town meeting, spelled out, which is what the practice is now. In 214, we changed the number of voters to call a town meeting to 200, which it conforms with state law. And in 215, uh, is just clarifying the language for previous changes. Is the discussion? Mr. Brown. I'd like to point out on the 200, uh, this requires that the Board of Selectmen shall call a special meeting with uh, 200 votes, and that is by state statute. Presently, I think we it's 100 and it's in there. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Ryan. should move the microphone back a bit, Thomas Day Ryan, Precinct 1. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have <coughs> a couple of amendments here, but did, uh, mi did uh, Mr. Piscino, did you mention Board of Ass Assessors in here somewhere? The Board of Assessors is under Section 3. Mm. Well, well, you did mention it. Uh, now, Mr. Moderator, should I wait for uh, Section 3 and 4 before they discuss the what? Because you're, you're voting on the amendments on each section. Uh, Mr. Elijah. Um, 
if you Tom, if you look behind me, there's a Board of Assessors uh, reference that's crossed out. Um, the Board of Assessors was listed in the charter or is currently listed in the charter under um, setting precincts. Um, neither the, the town engineers or any of the engineering staff, the GAS coordinator, the current board, or any assessors or anyone else could ever remember the Board of Assessors actually fulfilling any role whatsoever in that process, so they ask to be removed. That has nothing to do with other proposed changes with the board. Okay, so Mr. Mutter, uh, should we wait till Article 3 comes up and... Uh, assuming your, your motion is to, uh, to change the way... Uh, the That's the correct. That would come in Section 3, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Further discussion on Section 2? Yes, Mr. Uh, Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. I have a uh, question on uh, 2.12.1 regarding the Finance Committee. Um, I was one of, uh, depending on the day you ask me, um, one of the victims or the beneficiaries of <laughs> having to leave after, uh, before serving three full terms. I had served, um, filled one year, and uh, as the old charter was written, at the end of my second full term, I had to leave the Finance Committee. Like I said, some days, I, I'm really happy that happened. Some days I'm not. Um, I understand that um, it's really important that we that we do have some term limits on various committees. Obviously, the school committee and the board of a set, uh, and the uh, board of selectmen, their term limits come with the, the voters set their term limit, um, and they can go on as long as the voters see that they're doing a good job. Um, the finance committee seems like it's the only committee that actually has written in term limits. Uh, the zoning board, CPDC, uh, other boards um, don't have term limits written in. Um, I understand kind of the, the, the need to sort of have term limits where you can get new blood into different committees, but also having terms long enough so that um, there's institutional memory within each, each board. So I'm wondering um, if the, if the uh, charter committee looked at adding term limits to any of the other committees to sort of address the same thing, trying to get new blood uh, and balancing the need for keeping veteran members on there and why the Finance Committee is is, um, is really the only one that actually has term limits on it. Mr. Messino? Yeah, the committee did discuss term limits. Um, basically, the, in, the, the only reason that it's left here because that's the way the original charter was written. Uh, we did not add, it's not included in any other, and we decided that it would just be only the Finance Committee, particularly for the purpose of getting new people into the committee over a period of time. Yes, Mr. Ensminger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, question on the issue of the Board of Selectmen calling a special town meeting upon receipt of a petition with 200 or more signatures of voters is certified. Uh, I'm in favor of this, but I have a couple of questions. Number one, is there any kind of a designated format for such a petition, either furnished by the state or otherwise? And would that petition necessarily have to include warrant articles since the board would by necessity have to close the warrant for that town meeting uh, when it called that town meeting? Mr. Mayaris? I believe the um, town clerk has some forms that are provided by the state for this purpose. Um, they're not legally required, so they can, so a petition can be on a, on a, um, uh, in any form at least under the, uh, under the provisions of the charter. Um, it's hard for me to imagine a circumstance in which 200 people would ask for a special town meeting and not include some kind of warrant article. What would be the point of having the town meeting if, there wasn't, if they didn't want it? So I would assume that the, uh, that the petition would um, include one or more warrant articles. We, we don't want to write too many requirements into the charter because it's hard to amend the charter. So. Um, so we try to try to um, uh, write general provisions in the charter to the extent that it's necessary to elucidate 
uh, things uh, in greater detail, it, that seems like an appropriate thing to be done by bylaw. Mr. Ensminger. Do quickly at the microphone. Seems to me to be a separate petition to call the town meeting and then a se separate petition for each warrant article. Would that be the rule? Because Schleckman might want to add other things. Oh, well, with Schleckman, when they call it uh, a special town meeting, they can always add additional articles that once it's once that's called. Um, um, as a practical matter, I would imagine that that um, uh, that that would indeed happen as a, uh, a separate petition for each um, warrant article. Um, again, if we, we don't want to specify too many details in the charter. Um, we want uh, the charter to be written in a little bit more broad strokes, and if we find the need to, to specify these things in greater detail, then we'll do it, uh, we can do it with the bylaw. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, when I researched the reason for the 100 in the uh, charter, I couldn't find anything. However, I did find the 200, and this is the exact wording in the state statute, upon petition of uh, 200 voters. So I, I think that's uh, legal enough, and again, I won't charge the town council. Mr. Greenfield. David Greenfield, Precinct 5. Um, in um, 15, uh, 2 15 2, um, there, it's the, it's, it's a um, petition, um, and it, if I read it correctly, if you make a mark on it, it disqualifies it. Um, do I read that correctly? I would I would suggest that um, sub, uh, with a piece of paper being handed person to person to person and a dangerous pen being bandied about that there's a chance somebody's going to mark a paper and that this might just be a little too restrictive. Um, it it I wonder if we can amend it so that uh, the mark would have to appear to influence the meaning of the petition. An extraneous mark that is, has no impact on the meaning would seem to be I, rather minor. I, I don't believe that is part of the charter that we are changing, but that changes. Mr. Arena, do you have a comment? And I'll, I'll, what I'll, I'll come what back I'm, to you. What I'm obviously concerned about is uh, a number of people have signed their name to a petition. They're behind it, and the slightest mark could disqualify uh, their intent. Mr. Arena, I, I, I'll let you come, I'll come back to you, but Mr. Arena, do you have a point to, to this? Uh, John Arena, Precinct 1. Uh, Mr. Greenfield, you're exactly correct. You, I'm not sure of your tenure here, but you might remember, <laughs> I think four or five years ago, this very section was amended by a different board to specifically include that. At the time, I raised that as the very same objection you are today, that people in the ordinary course of signing and reading might inadvertently make a mark. Uh, in their wisdom, the board of the day elected to preserve that language. Um, I'd support um, that component, that, that phrase being stricken for the reasons you described. It's simply common sense that in accidents happen, and as long as it doesn't change the intent of the meaning or there's no consequence to such a mark. This is not part of the uh, charter changes, so I would not uh, think that this would be within the scope. Oh, it's just, so it's. It's the way the charter is today. It's not something that right. has been it's added in by the, it's not being proposed by the charter commission. The committee basically never did really discuss that particular change. We just decided since it was in the charter, we would leave it in the charter since it's just previ previously voted at a previous meeting by this body. Point of order. Uh, I'm not, uh, John Arena, Precinct 1, uh, Mr. Moderator, I'm not sure that's entirely 
accurate, it may be correct, but it may not be complete. The original language that was passed by town meeting included a fragment which has been dropped, which permitted the petition language to be, sub to be distributed by email in the alternative. That's, that's been dispensed with. So there are changes to this language that were passed by this body that do not appear in this document. I don't necessarily disagree with that change, but it's not correct, not accurate to say that this is intact verbatim. Mr. Lelasher. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my, my best understanding is the document, the charter that stands today is the full charter that town meeting approved. Now there is one caveat and it's been in a footnote for quite some time. Um, once the Charter Review Committee was formed, I decided it was silly to go to the voters with what a previous town meeting had done to get an approval when the whole charter was being reviewed and another approval would be needed. So technically speaking, um, the voters have not approved some of the changes that town meeting made, I'll say, two years ago. It's not the same set that you're talking about four years ago. Um, but my understanding of the charter that started as the raw document is that is the real deal. And I don't remember a discussion about email um, petitions at all. Okay. Well, the question here is, is the proposed change he wants to make Correct. within within the changes that the Charter Commission is, is uh, proposing, or is this part of the, the Charter as it is? Well, you learn something every uh, new all the time. Um, okay, so if I get, if I have this right, town meeting voted to add that paragraph. Okay, but it never was submitted to the voters. Okay, so it it doesn't, and so it does not exist in the current form, um, and. Um, what that appears to, that, that, that language appears to set up the, the situation, not that people can sign petitions by email, but just that, that the form of the petition can be circul can, can be provided by the town clerk by email instead of making, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of copies of it. Um, okay, so where does that take us? What are, what are we trying to What are we trying to so accomplish here? My question is: so the the place where he would like to change is not part of the charter today, even though it may have been voted on by this body. The, the, so the extraneous markings are 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 part of the. Oh, it is part of it. Okay, which is what I asked. Original clause, right? Yeah. Okay, so I would rule that out of order. Then. Point of order. Pre point of order. Thank you, Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Is it my understanding that the only debatable issues um, that we're doing tonight are the proposed changes by the Charter Committee, but that anything else that's been in the Charter for a while is not something that we can discuss or amend? Correct. Well, what, that's not, that's clear. That, well, yes it I is. Mean, the the uh, town has been warned what the proposed changes yeah. are. To go above and beyond that would be above and beyond what the town has been warned about. But we've, I mean, we're talking about the charter. Correct. So, so I don't understand why things that, and it was my understanding that the charter is being debated. So it if it's only the, if we only can discuss changes that the charter committee have brought forth, uh, it doesn't seem like we're doing, uh, you know, justice to the whole process of reviewing the charter. The, 
changes that are proposed are what is under discussion. The, because we're making changes to the charter, it does not open the entire charter. Well, when we did the zoning, I mean, it wasn't just the amendments that were, uh, that were discussed. The whole zoning uh, bylaw was discussed. So um, I don't, I don't, I mean, this is not my understanding. I don't know if it's the understanding of town meeting in general that what, w the purpose of what our debate is today. I mean, I know that the char you guys have done a, a lot of work going through this, but it's my understanding that we could amend any pieces of this, not just what well, the charter let, let me give committee you has, um, has put forth. Let me give you an example. What if we decided to, what if somebody proposed tonight to eliminate the Board of Selectmen? It wouldn't be, obviously, it wouldn't be within the scope of this. So, right, there's, there's shades of what's, what's of magnitude, but the, I, what I, I would hope if that happened that we would vote it down. Right, but, <laughs> but the point is that the town would not have been properly warned that that was a possibility. And there was, would be no chance for members to uh, research that. So, as we have always done, what is before the body is what is being proposed. You can make changes to that <coughs> with, with of the changes that we're trying to make. You can amend those or propose amendments. Make them, mo you in general, you have to make them smaller, but there are cases where you may expand a bit on what you can do. But the only thing that is open is what are the proposed changes to the charter. And that okay. is the way we always operate. Okay. Could, 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 you, could I ask, uh, may, maybe it would help me understand um, that if we wanted to make that amendment, how would we do it if you, not you, you while have we're to talking about the charter? You would have to include that in a town meeting warrant sometime in the future. So the... So even though the sentence it would go in is both being added to and deleted from uh, that correct that is not particular part of item the, that is not part of the change. Okay, correct. thank you. Further discussion. Yes, Mr. Lippo. Uh, John Lippis, uh, Precinct Seven. Um, to follow up on that, the words were added or on any copy thereof. So I'll propose an amendment that says extraneous markings are allowed on copies thereof. The original petition can't be changed, but original copies could have other markings on them, or uh, copies could have other markings on them, but not the original. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure what you're proposing. Oh, oh, I see, okay. All right, I will accept that then. Is there a second? Second. Okay, need to take a note. Okay, further discussion? Nope. Hold on a second. Mayors? Okay. First of all, I think that the intent is is to not to strike the words and any copy thereof in the bottom paragraph, but in the middle paragraph, dealing with no, the right just before that, or to or any copy thereof. Yeah. Is that correct? So I think the intent of was to strike the words or any copy thereof from the from the language that has to do with extraneous markings, right? Yes. Okay, so it's this language up here. Right. Not not the one that was highlighted previously. Oh, okay. Right, yeah. Okay. So we got that straight. Now let me just speak to my associate about that.
Take three hands. So, for everybody, this is Eric Russell. He's uh, my associate, and um, uh, he provides all um, legal knowledge. Uh, he points out that there are a line of cases um, where petitions have been disallowed because of markings on copies. Um, the language that is proposed there mirrors the language um, that the uh, uh, SJC has required. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea to deviate from that. It's um, a, a potential source of problem for us. So I would not recommend that this particular amendment be adopted. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. McKenzie. Um, <clears throat> yes, Bruce McKenzie, Precinct 8. Um, I also was not under the impression that we were restricted to only the changes that the uh, Charter Committee made. Um, um, Concerning the um, extraneous markings, um, there's a paragraph break just above it that says, for purposes of this prohibition. Um, it seems to me that if the charter committee can add the word names in there, so for the purpose of this prohibition, the term extraneous markings shall not include names, names was added. Could we also add something else? Um, for example, let's say you're, let's say, uh, uh, um, a voter is signing a petition and they start highlighting things. Or let's say an opponent to a petition just scribbles all over it. That would invalidate all the signatures already on there. So it seems to me we could add, for purposes of this prohibition, the term extraneous marking shall not include something like Markings made by a voter, marking made by a signer, marking made in some way. I don't want to propose specific wording, but I'd like to suggest that somebody with legal knowledge should study that for a couple days <laughs> and, and put a correction right about there. Well, Thank actu you. actually, the kinds of things that you just talked about is exactly what uh, uh, is intended to be prohibited. A, a somebody signing the petition highlights uh, a particular word or um, underlines things like that. That's that's exactly what the SJC does not want to allow. Uh, but the question is, if the if you've got 20 signature lines and 19 are filled out, yep. and if the 20th signer mm -hmm. starts marking, mm -hmm. either by accident or in jest or maliciously, yes. you've lost 19 signatures. Exactly. And that yeah. is the and intended and result. I, I remember this discussion a couple of years ago. And <laughs> well, it, it, anyway, I understand that the, the, uh, the yeah. Supreme Judicial Court of that. The, is the, point is, the point is when these things are being reviewed later, you can't tell most of the time whether that highlight or that cross or whatever was made by the first guy or the last guy on the, uh, uh, who signed. You can't tell that. So that's the reason why it, the rule is so strict. Uh, I think it's a serious problem. So. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion? None appear. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tony DeRezzo, Precinct 2. I've got a question about Section 2.13D. Is there now any way for citizens to put a warrant article on the town meeting agenda without calling for a special election, a special meeting? Mr. Pacino, the answer to that is yes. They could go to the Board of Selectmen and request the Board of Selectmen put one on under their, under their name. Petition to whom? So, but if the Board of Selectmen say no, what happens to the Okay, so the Board of Selectmen have to accept any petition. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes, any, as they say, any legally valid petition they would have to accept. Further discussion? Mr. DiBerio. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Ron Dario, Precinct 6. Uh, I'd like to look at um, uh, uh, Article 2.2 and uh, third paragraph down. I'm not sure if I can, this is just a simple request. I don't know if it's eligible, but it says, uh, this is in regard to uh, when districts have been revised and at the end of that third paragraph, uh, I'm reading here, the Board of Selectmen shall also post a map and list in the town hall and at least in one public place in each precinct. So th that has to, um, to advertise the change. And I would, where the change is fairly important with districts being redesigned, I would like to add as well as in the uh, local news media in order to get the word out, if that's permissible. Well, again, it looks like we're trying to change an area that is not being a proposed change. Yeah, just consulting with the town manager here, if that were the case, you said that would go on the website and it would, you would go into some sort of local news media, a news medium. Hmm? Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. I have a question with Section 2.3, Town Meeting Membership. And um, there's a discrepancy between the translation guide on page 9 and then the warrant on page 14. And my question is, um, if you're looking at page 14, the third paragraph down, it's the second and third sentence, which isn't in the translation guide, but it is in here, and it says, in the event of a tie vote, resulting in a failure to elect the full number of town meeting members in any precinct, the vacancy created thereby shall be filled until the next town election. Those words were added until the next town election after the translation guide. And I'm wondering what the purpose is because as I read that, to me, it, it, if there were nine people on the ballot and there were seven who received over 200 votes and then number eight and number nine, were in a tie, so they each received 150 votes. The vacancy shall be filled. So I, I think according to this procedure, town meeting members would decide between number eight and nine, but then it says thereby be filled until the next town election. So I'm wondering, does that mean that if somebody's running for a three-year term and they're on the ballot and they and there's a tiebreaker, they don't get the full term? What, what section are you on again? It's please? section 2.3, and if you're looking in the yellow warrant, it's on yep. page 14, mm -hmm. and in the translation guide, it's on page 9, and it's the third paragraph down, and what is, it, it differs in, it differs in those words between the translation guide and the warrant. So it's the third paragraph down, and it, in the event of a tie vote resulting in a failure to elect the full number of town meeting members in any precinct, the vacancy created shall be filled by a vote of the remaining town meeting members, but the words until the next annual town election have been added, and I'm wondering what the purpose of that is. Mr. Meares. So the purpose is to bring it into conformance with um, state law. Um, so state law, the normal procedure is, is what's laid out here, that they are elected uh, by the precinct uh, only until the next election. This could be varied by our charter, um, but, the, um, but the, uh, as written, the charter would um, simply follow the guidance of state law. Okay, I, I would like to propose taking that out, and I think that's allowed because it's not actually in the charter. It, it appears to have been yes. 
added. So okay. just can understand, I make Just understand that taking it out won't make any difference. If you take it out, the state law will still apply. So if there were nine people on a ballot and seven of them get 200 votes and, and number eight and nine each get 199 votes and then the precinct decides which one of those two people is the eighth town meeting member, they don't get a full three-year term. They only, their term suddenly becomes a one-year term? That is what state law would require. If you want, if you take this out yeah. and don't write something else to take its place, then okay. it will default to the state law. So if you want to, if you want a different result, you can't just take this out. That's okay. what I'm telling you. You have to write something to take its place. That they will serve the full term if that's what you want. But I I would like that. I mean, I you know I. I understand that there's been questions about people getting written in, you know, lots of writing candidates for one, but I think that if somebody has made the effort to be on the ballot and there are nine candidates and one of them, you know, you lose by one vote, you know, you have a, a 200 votes, whatever, but you lose by one vote. So, yeah, I would like, I, I, I would think that if you are running for three-year term, you should get that three-year term if you're on the ballot and... You do. So, so what, what, what can I do? Okay. How do I? So, first of all, we can't make a distinction between somebody who's on the ballot and somebody who's a writer. That's fine with we're me. Not, we're not going there. Okay, okay? no, no. Uh, we tried to do that before, and people didn't like that. So I don't want to make that distinction. But I think if you're running for a three-year term and you're elected, you should get your three-year term. It's going to take me a moment. All right. While we're waiting, I'll come back to you. Is there other discussion in this section? Yes. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. I guess just to counter that, I, I, I understand the sentiment, but the person who doesn't get elected has only lost by the same number of votes, so they have to wait three more years. So uh, I, I'm guessing that the intent here is to say that the uh, – you know, the uh, precinct makes the decision and it just carries over to the next election and then they have at it again to, to be elected. So I, I, I think you have to look at both the people in the, in the tie. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Bruce McKenzie again, Precinct 8. <coughs> um, I have a I have a proposed one-word clarification, which I think you might allow. Uh, section 2.3 on town meeting membership. Um, it could be construed that when you revise a when you revise a couple precinct boundaries, that all precincts have to have all their town me members revoted, and I don't think that's the intention. So, at the end of the first line, I'd like to add the word revise. So, this is. Section 2.3, titled Town Meeting Membership. Uh, yeah, the top of the, very top of the screen. At th so, th so um, it, yeah, right there. So at the end of that line, I'd like to add the word revised. So it would read, uh, the voters of each revised precinct shall elect 24 town meeting members. Just to clarify that you don't have to elect the whole town. Well, again, this isn't a section that has not been proposed change. Um, uh, Am I wrong on that? Well, okay. I have some additional comments. The um, the meeting the uh, the translation guide has a lot of differences. If people look on page um, eight, I believe, of the translation guide, you see lots of red and blue. It's very confusing. There, um, there's even the verb left out in the translation guide. Uh, the translation guide refers to boundaries of precincts. Um, so, so, so the translation guide added the word boundaries, but the boundaries do not appear in the, in the warrant. Also, the, tra the translation guide uses the word altered um, on the third line. It says altered pursuant to that. The warrant says, uses the word revised. 
and the translation guide has the phrase pursuant to section 2.2, but the warrant does not have that phrase. So I found three different discrepancies between the warrant and the, transla and the translation guide. Mr. Lash had a different on it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, very clearly and very loudly, I put a disclaimer in here that says, what's in the yellow jacketed thing is the actual language we're debating. Um, again, like zoning, this had so many hands in the, in the cooking process that that was a best efforts. So if you're finding discrepancies, the handout that's meant to be the uh, sort of the, the clarification document, just ignore it entirely. What's, what's in the, the um, uh, warrant report is the language, the language that this body should be debating. And I, I apologize for any instance where it's not exactly identical. Okay, I still request to add the word revised at the end of the first line. You can rule it out of order, but I, I am requesting that. It, so it reads, the voters of any revised precinct shall elect 24 members. Unless I'm mistaken, this is the section that we're not changing, so I would rule that out of order. If we do that point of order, how do we know we're not changing it? Uh, uh, the translation guide says you are changing it, but the translation guide is wrong. Well, let's research it. Is it this part of one of our changes? Well, I, I mean, you no, can take several is, minutes yeah. and let other discussion go on. Yeah. Um, and and also is, this is not part of one of the changes. Um, no, I'm, also, I'm, Mr. Moderator, I will not be able to make my other proposed change to the to the precinct oh, boundary okay. line. Okay, I hadn't read. Okay, yeah, I, I know that won't be allowed. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the intent is here, as always, in terms of when the precincts have always changed, all eight of them. When they get redistricted, and every member stands has to restand for election at that point because all eight precincts change, and that's how it's been well, this I, way forever. I, uh, uh, it's yes, just I not know they, one precinct that changed. Yeah, um, I know they usually all change every census, but in the event that only a couple lines change, is it the intention, or could this be, be misconstrued I, that the whole I, town? I've has been to here since 1980, and I've yet to see only one precinct change. I've lived here since everybody the other night told me how long you lived. I've lived here 61 years, and I've yet to see one precinct change. <laughs> Further discussion? Is there other questions? Okay, I think we're still waiting for an answer here. Okay. Mayors. Okay, so the, the language we came up with uh, up here yep. is to change until the next annual town election to until expiration of the term. Okay, until the, um, it was also suggested for the specified term, w either whatever you think, but, but I think okay, th th that, that yeah. will fulfill the purpose that's th this that achieves will what you want what to I want to do okay yeah. so that's the, uh, so I would like to propose that change and um, I hope people support this the only time that the length of term is <coughs> dependent upon the number of votes is when we've had a redistricting people win and lose by one vote all the time in town elections um, so you know I, I uh, I think that if someone's running for a three-year term and they only lose by one vote, they still should get their three-year term. Thank you. Is there a second for that? Second. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Downey? Uh, 
Yeah, John Downing from Precinct 7. This is not so much a comment um, about a change or, or, or review here, but actually a point of frustration on my part that these two documents don't match up. As it says here on the bottom of the translation guide, section two, bold and crossed out, please see the following pages for a full listing of all the changes proposed in the charter by the Charter Review Committee. And now I find that other changes were made and I, am un I don't have the confidence to believe that what I'm supposed to vote on is what I've reviewed. And I, I, it's really frustrating. It was the same way last time when we used the strike out delete version and we had the wrong version. I feel really frustrated. I feel like I've wasted my time. So it's just a comment. Don't bother producing the strike out delete comment if you can't do it right. I, it's not that hard to do. Further discussion? Point of order. Moderator, I'm, I'm not entirely sure a point of order or a point of information, but on this section um, that's the subject of this uh, amendment, should not there be also be a change in order to be consistent with um, Ms. Binder's in intent uh, as interpreted by town council, should there not also be a change in the second part of that sentence provided, however, that the balance of any, yeah unless I'm misunderstanding that, should that not also be a part of that proposed amendment? Would the mover accept that as part of the, uh, her motion? Okay. <laughs> Is there any objection? Objection? Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Hatma? Glenn Hartswood, Precinct 4, I'm a member of the Charter Review Committee. I want to speak against uh, Ms. Binda's uh, amendment. Um, by her very uh, example, uh, if you had seven members that were elected fully and two tied for, say, the eighth and the ninth possible position, one of those has to uh, not be elected. And they may have 199 votes apiece. So if you have then the uh, precinct pick one of those, they should only be elected then for a single uh, year until the next town election. Further discussion? Yes. Patrick O'Sullivan, Precinct 5. Just to s elaborate further on that, a tie vote in a town meeting election results in a failure to elect the full number of town meeting members. The charter is very clear on that point. Uh, the person that is named, uh, quote, elected to fill that vacancy isn't actually elected. They're technically an appointed member of uh, town meeting and the proposed amendment to make them a full elected member goes directly against section 2.1, which states town meeting shall be elected by the voters of each precinct. This is really a matter of principle. We don't want our town's representative legislative body to be appointed by anyone. And if we must, because there's a vacancy, we want that to be for the shortest amount of time possible. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote on our two amendments? First is Mr. Lippitz. Do we have that up there? That was the um, the extraneous marks. No, on the second one, uh, because it was the part that was changed. Mr. Lippitt? 
Okay. All right. So we will now move on to uh, this been the, the expiration of the terms. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We will now move on to section three, uh, ar charter article three, excuse me. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, article three deals with elected boards, uh, office and, and uh, boards. Uh, be aware that 3-2 is the subject of also a special article. That will be under Article 8. Uh, in terms of 3-1, there is a, a major change that's being made in Article 3. Uh, the Board of Assessors, we, the charter, in terms of the charter, the charter committee is moving that from an elected board to an appointed board. The uh, Charter Committee had extensive discussion on the Board of Assessors and the qualifications that you need in order to be a, 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 in order to do that job properly and assess properly. It was decided that there needs a special skill set, and that skill set the Charter Commission determined cannot be it is not being met by an elected process. It is the feeling that that skill set should be met by an appointed. Uh, the Board of Assessors have been consulted on this, the present Board of Assessors, and they are fully in agreement that the Board of Assessors should be moved to an elected position. And I, and, uh, appoint, appoint, excuse me, appointed. Appointed position. And I do believe there, there was a letter that was written by one of the, assess the assessors and support that. So that is the major, that is the major change that you're going to see in Article 3.1. Basically, the Board of Assessors has been moved to uh, Article 4 under the appointed boards and committees. Um, in terms of the other change that the, uh, the uh, change was made in 3.1, the VOC representative reference was removed because that is really uh, unnecessary because of state law. Under 3.2, uh, basically, there was a change in the administrator section to simplify the, uh, the, the appointments. And basically, you know, Bob's explanation, the transitional language concerning appointment from the original charter is removed as historically interesting but no longer needed. As default, these and many other boards and committees are listed as appointed by the Board of Selectmen. There is no proposed change to the actual appointment process. <coughs> The creation of the boards and committee is moved to section 4.14 and is not changed with regard to the Board of Selectmen. 3.3, three, there's uh, just some language change uh, to give flexibility to the Board of Selectmen. 3.4 clarifies uh, the town manager may delegate the operational maintenance responsibilities to the, uh, li uh, for the uh, library building. 3.5, there's no change. Again, 3.6 is the major change again. This is where 3-6, we are moving the assessors to the appointed section and that because of the special qualifications. Uh, in terms of the 3-6, yeah, basically, uh, in terms of 3-6, we're keeping the term of the moderate at one year. Uh, the committee had extensive discussion on this we all thought Alan does a great job here, and we wanted to give him the option of actually staying more than one year at a time. But uh, he himself made the point that uh, he, it only should be one term, one one year term. And the reason why, in case there's any kind of a problem with the moderator, you can remove the moderator at that point. We're all set. Yep. Further discussion? Mr. Ryan? Thomas J. Ryan, Precinct 1. Just a question, Mr. Moderator, with the amendment that I gave you, um, uh, do I have to wait for Article 5 to come up to delete the word appraising? Is that correct? Because we're on, we're on Article 3 right now, right? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm just okay so I move to amend <laughs> this article by uh, at uh, 3.6. Board of Assessors, 
And I wanted to amend the out by restoring the words to read, there shall be a board of assessors consisting of three members elected for three year terms, so arranged that one term expires each year. Is there a and second? Oh, and sorry. also, uh, well, I'll get to the other bit in a second. Okay. I, I have a question about this. If this amendment passes, does it render moot section 4.1 in the article about uh, the list of the Board of Assessors? Is that correct? If this should pass, we would probably have to make an adjustment on <laughs> section 4 as well. Okay, fine. Now, what uh, started out is uh, well, it's kind of confusing. We get two sets of documents here. And uh, <coughs> it's very simple what my amendment uh, proposes to do. It restores the right to vote for members of the Board of Assessors. What I'm talking about here is we are depriving the voters of Reading to elect the Board of Assessors. In the town report of 1890, it pointed out that the members of the Board of Selectmen were also the assessors. After that year, how, how did they like that, huh? After that, after that year, the voters achieved the right to vote for members of the Board of Assessors. We have been doing that for 125 years, and we have the right to vote for the members of the Board of Assessors. In 1925, there was a move to have the assessors appointed by the Board of Selectmen, and that went nowhere. Now, where do we get this right to vote, supposedly? Well, not in the Constitution of the United States, because that doesn't gar guarantee us any right to vote, not in the, not in the seven articles. But in three of the amendments, the 15th, 19th, and 26th, it contains these words, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, gender, and age, respectively. This article, as it stands without my amendment, deprives us of our right to vote. In the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, first part, a declaration of the rights of the inhabitants of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Article 9, in part, all the inhabitants of the Commonwealth having such qualifications as they shall establish by their frame of government have an equal right to elect officers and to be elected. Again, have an equal right to elect. So, what are the qualifications to serve in the Board of Assessors? In 2001, I was elected the Board of Assessors, and I was re-elected in 2004 and 2007. Twice I served as chairman of the board. All three times I met the criteria or the qualifications to serve on the board. Now the qualifications are as follows. They're the same qualifications we need to be elected selectmen and town meeting members. And it's a big long list. First, get on the ballot. Second, get more votes than the other person. That's it. Those are the total qualifications. There are none others, even though some say specific talents are required. Get on the ballot and get elected. And talk about the rights to vote. This article, without my amendment, deprives us of the right to vote. Yet, in Section five, uh, 6, associate members shall have the same participation and voting rights as permanent members in the Article 7, it grants voting rights to associate members after 100 days of a service. And these two sections are granting voting rights to some, while this more article, as it stands without my amendment, is taking away our rights of the citizens to vote, as guaranteed by the Commonwealth Constitution. So I'm asking town meeting to vote yes on this amendment, and please don't take away my right to vote 
and the right of everyone in this room to vote and take away the votes of the 16,000 plus registered voters in Reading, whether they choose to vote or not. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Cook? Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. A question for Town Council. Is there a right in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to vote for assessors? Or can, can in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, can we also appoint assessors? Mr. Mayari? The right to vote does not, uh, it does not specify which town officials are to be elected and which are to be appointed. Um, you do have the right to vote for your representatives and when you vote for your selectmen, selectmen make many appointments to many different committees um, and that uh, the, right to, the right to vote does not signify that the selectmen should be deprived of the, of, of the ability to appoint committees. So um, uh, the right to vote you know, simply means that, that you, th there needs to be a mechanism for your representatives to be elected, but then they make decisions to appoint um, other boards uh, on your behalf. Further discussion? Mr. Cook? Another, fo another follow up. Um, did, did not the Board of Assessors take a vote with respect to this? I believe the, uh, the warrant cites a vote. Still alive. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, concurrent with the Charter Review Committee's discussion of this and, and many other things, I, I contacted the Board of Assessors and asked them their opinion without mentioning what was being discussed. And they said we'd formally like to request that we become appointed. So their view is very clear on this. I understand it's different from, uh, from Mr. Ryan and the past boards, but all three members currently feel very strongly that they wish to be appointed and do not wish to run because they view that this is a trend in the assessor's uh, business, if you will, that it's a highly technical job, and as they themselves uh, say, the qualifications for running for an office as opposed to the qualifications for holding an office can be quite different. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. D'Addario? Uh, I would like to uh, make a slight change to uh, in 3.4, Board of Library Trustees. And this is one I think we can do. Uh, in the, looks like the third paragraph, it, uh, in the end of the third paragraph, the Board of Library Trustees shall appoint a library director and shall define his duties. So I'm just looking back of all the time I've been in Reading and out of respect for all the uh, very capable women directors that we've had, that we change the his to her. Thank you. Mr. Fasino. Mr. Moderator, we have defined in both the charter and the bylaws that his also means her. Well, if that's the case, then her probably could also mean his. We could <laughs> probably go either <laughs> way. So I suggest that maybe we put her in, and, and that could mean his. Unfortunately, Ron, you, you're, you're asking for changes that would be extensively throughout the entire bylaw and, and also through the uh, charter. And again, her, we define as his also meaning her, and that's the way we've done it in the charter also, in the, in the bylaws also. Mr. Donnelly Moran. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Charles Donnelly Moran, Precinct 7. I actually have looked through the uh, charter and there are at least a hundred uses of his or uh, him or he uh, and that uh, you know just using uh, find in a uh, word program was able to identify those locations 
and that I know that having looked at the wording that we can't just simply substitute uh, the name of a title uh, of an office holder uh, for, uh, to replace those. But I do wonder why in the 21st century we are using uh, exclusive language including ex instead of using inclusive language. Uh, and I would hope that in 10 years, uh, if the charter is uh, approved and the charter is reviewed, in another 10 years that uh, the, uh, the committee uh, seriously consider it. Uh, you know, we can't do that in this meeting. It'd take too long to go through all of them, but really, you know, it wouldn't take that long uh, to have uh, have done that. Uh, thank you. Other discussion? Yes. Thank you, Linda Snow Docks of Precinct 1. I actually am sort of piggybacking on the previous two gentlemen in that I would like to suggest that we change the name of selectmen to select board and I realize there is a statement aligning it with the state references. However, we do have a sentence there that would take care of this. I think the executive powers of the town should be vested in the select board, the board of se the board select board shall have all the powers and duties granted to the boards of selectmen by the constitution and general laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think that would probably define it okay statewide. But my suggestion is because um, in line with what Mr. LeLature and many people have said, this document was written many years ago and historically the, select, the board of selectmen was a group of men voted in to govern the town and that is a very different case now. It's a mixed gender group and we do call people select woman or select man but the group I think should be a select board um, I think it's important now, not in 10 years, to bring the titles up to date. Um, I think that words, as, as mentioned before, words are very powerful, and I think that we need to um, acknowledge that old assumptions need to be relegated to the past. Um, I think that there's been a really nice job done in this document already that the, um, where it used to say chairman now says chair, and I think that's a step in the right direction. So I really applaud all the work that's been done on this document, and I think that there have been strides made. I just suggest that this needs to happen as well, and I'm wondering if um, on, page, uh, on page 49, um, in one of the, the booklets and on page 37 in the other one, the town clerk is given the right to make unsubstantive changes in the document. And so the changing of his and her or making the grammar right might fall under that, um, that right, that responsibility. And likewise, changing select board, it actually would save some space in the document to say select board rather than board of selectmen. So I'd like to respectfully request that be changed in the charter, please. Okay, that would be up without outside of the scope, but uh, there is the question as, as to whether or not that's a change that the town clerk could make. I don't know if that's something that the town council could answer. I think the answer is no, uh, and here's why. That provision that authorizes non-substantive changes is, as you say, things like um, uh, to correct grammar, to correct misspelling, things like that. Um, if we were to draw the line someplace higher than that, I think that, that we would run afoul of um, the statutes and constitutional provisions that govern the, um, how the charter can be amended. 
um, changing the names of boards is, at least in my view, a substantive change because you're changing the name. And um, so I don't think it can be done that way. Um, okay. Further discussion? Ms. Snow Duncan? Oh, I'll take a follow up first and I'll come back to you. Yes, Ms. I'm calling on you, yes. Um, I, I hear what you're saying and I understand that perhaps the changing to the select board is a more substantive change, but I'm wondering because the rights are um, defined within the text that it could be designated as the title um, so that it's, it's defined in the text as to how it would be considered by the state. So changing the name would still be defined in the same way. Mr. Mary. If you're asking can this body adopt an amendment changing all the references to a board of selectmen to select board. That's a question for the moderator, whether he would consider that to be within the scope. I, and I consider it not to be within the scope. It's, it's, it's not something that was brought before this body. Mr. McKenzie. Um, Ms. Doxer referred to section 11 on page 49. That only refers to the numbering of the sections. So it says the town clerk is hereby authorized to make non-substantive changes to the numbering of the sections. Only the numbering. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Mandel. Uh, Bob Mandel, Precinct 6. I'd like to go back to the 3.6 on the Board of Assessors. Um, According to the information um, that I've received, apparently the amount of, amount of education one needs to do this is one course and three classes. Uh, that's according to Mr. Ryan. So I wonder if some of the existing or the, one of the existing Board of Assessors could explain why he thinks he should be appointed and not not an elected position. Mr. Lalasha. Is there someone around? I'm, I'm not one of them, but I could do my best. Um, uh, Mr. Ryan's exactly right that to stand for the election, you don't need any of those qualifications. But much like other professions, there's ongoing professional development requirements that both Mr. Ryan and the current board members and probably all in between must meet and have met. So I'm not exactly sure beyond that what your question was. Well, so, so the, uh, apparently the motivation for this was, gee, it's a very detailed and very difficult position, but now, now I, I hear that it's a simple three classes in order to fulfill the job. So it doesn't sound like there's an excessive amount of education needed to fulfill the position. So from my standpoint, I, I would prefer to have this continue to be an elected position rather than an appointed position. Um, it's, it's difficult to comment on how hard or, or how easy the material is, but the point is there is an ongoing requirement, but that requirement only starts once you are in the position. Um, there's no requirement to get into the position, and the current board feels that a, an appointing authority would be better vetted um, to determine who would have those qualifications than someone that may just run, uh, you know, if you ever wanted me to right. run for well, assessor, well, that wouldn't work out well. Well, it seems to me that if you're not interested in, if you're interested in fulfilling the position, then you should be interested in getting the necessary education to fulfill a position. That's my yeah, point. Yeah, and beyond what I've said, I can't really speak okay. for the board. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. I support uh, the original amendment to take it out of an elected function and make it as an appointed function. If we recall the role of what the Board of Assessors do, so much of, of, of our ability to spend money is based on what's assessed 
um, the Board of Assessors has to deal with abatement procedure and um, the, um, uh, the Revenue Department in Boston has to certify that our assessments are correct in even setting the tax rate. So it's become a very technical position and, and not to say that the folks who are running for those office don't have those qualifications. Um, there's a lot of negative things that can happen if they get it wrong. So having at an appointed position where we know that they're properly vetted with the right education and the right kind of background, the right experiences, I think leaves the town less at risk than if we have uh, an, an elected board. So that's why I think it uh, is a good idea to have it uh, appointed rather than elected. Thank you. Yes. Just one follow up. You know, Mr. Berman has actually hit upon what it, the committee discussed in terms of having the expertise and somebody who could be appointed. Uh, one of the other things we discussed is on several elections, there has been no candidate to run for the Board of Assessors. Further discussion? Yes, in the back row. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ralph Carl LaRusso from Precinct 6, former member of the Board of Assessors, and have also been a former town appraiser uh, outside of this community. Um, the technical responsibilities for the Board of Assessors are far less than what they are for the town appraiser. Uh, Mr. Quinn, who's currently on the board, several prior members, Mr. Uh, Ryan, uh, I can't think of others, they were all took the course, passed the course. I think the greatest personal qualification you need to be a board of assessor member is common sense and nothing more. It's not the technical aspects that the same the town appraiser has to use. We've been fortunate, I think, in the past to have some very qualified people run. The last two times the, praise, the assessors were elected, they're qualified people, but they were elected by more votes than what it will come under this bylaw change. It was going to be five at the maximum. They were elected by, I think, six and, or 11 and 34, if I recall. I'm in favor of this amendment, and I fully support it, and I wish you would too. Don't take our right away to pick who we directly represents us in regards to taxation. I think that's a basic fundamental right that was brought about by the revolutionary fathers of this country. No taxation without direct representation. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? We have uh, one amendment before us, Mr. Ryan's uh, amendment that would restore the uh, Board of Assessors to an elected position. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We'll now move on to section four. Charter, uh, charter now, amendment. Charter. Now my turn to hand it over to Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm not gonna be quite as elaborate as uh, my predecessor. The hour's getting late. And I do have enough fun to that, but that's all right. Uh, the first change you'll see in Article 4 is the one that we just discussed. Uh, the appraisal will be now appointed by the town manager. And uh, Mr. Ryan gave the history of it, 1890. And before that, they uh, were also the Board of Assessors and the Board uh, Selectmen. Can you imagine that today? Thank you, no. Uh, Number two that I have on here is the Historical Commission and the Town Forest Commission. They're still going to be uh, appointed, but the selectmen would have the uh, authority to change the number of memberships. Um, in the past, <coughs> excuse me, in the past they've had problems getting people to fill the thing, so we felt that we would leave it to the discretion of the Board of Selectmen to decide whether they want three members, five members, uh, however. Uh, the next one on the agenda that I will talk about is the Charter Review Committee, one of my favorites. Uh, since the Charter has come into effect in 1986, uh, we've only reviewed, I think, 10 years ago. And perhaps the reason that uh, this Charter Committee had come into view was perhaps some of my own feelings about um, 
past uh, determinations by previous town council that ruled that FinCom didn't have to report uh, financial articles. So, so w w what's it doing in there? Uh, then another one came up, uh, thanks to our town clerk, uh, said we don't have to take an oath of office. Well, I can't be thrown out if I don't take an oath of office. So why is that in there? So that's probably one of the two things that we uh, looked at. And while I'm talking about this for a minute, I'd like to thank the uh, town manager uh, for helping us on the committee and perhaps putting up with the particularly, I think I was in there every other day, but uh, I'd like to thank him. Yeah, oh, he, he just <laughs> corrected me every day. But uh, I hope he didn't take it personally. If he did, that's too bad. But, <laughs> okay. Uh, Article 414, uh, 4.14. Uh, this, I think we, or at least in my opinion, we put in there to allow all the elected boards and committees to make subcommittees. Uh, there are many subcommittees that are there now. Uh, I don't know how they came, could do it legally. Uh, this will allow them to appoint uh, subcommittees. And a per perfect example of this would be the committee that was formed by the superintendent of the schools to look at the early childhood uh, thing. In my own opinion, that's a skirt around the open meeting laws. Perfectly legal, but if a search committee had been around, uh, a, uh, excuse me, a, a, this type of committee had the ability to do that, we wouldn't have to worry about that. The next item is that's of any significance is the associate members. Uh, this was put in the request of the Historical Commission. As Mr. Uh, Pacino said, it was because of the problems that they had getting a quorum for the summer abnormal demolition delay. Now, one of the things that we felt very strongly on was the 180 days that they would have to serve before they could be uh, appointed. We left all the rest of it uh, to the appointing authority or in a bylaw, however it may be. And I think one of the reasons that we felt that it should be 180 days, uh, in all due respect for the Board of Selectmen or any other appointing authority, um, they couldn't put a ringer in three days before an important article came up for, uh, for them to vote on. So we felt that 180 days would also give uh, enough people, enough time for the people to get up to speed and, uh, you know, get a little knowledge of it. Uh, and it does uh, leave into, uh, okay, the, no, associate members, okay, I'm sorry. It still leaves uh, the viability of the Zoning Board of Appeals, which by state law have to have uh, those. And that about wraps up my major points on uh, Article 4. Mr. Ensminger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Monitor. I, I rise to make some comments uh, and ask some questions about Section 4.15, and I may want to offer an amendment. Uh, if this is passed, uh, our method of uh, – there, there would have to be some sort of provision in the Charter, Town Bylaw, or Massachusetts General Law to designate boards that have uh, associate members. Many of our boards do have associate members right now. Uh, I'm going to ask town council if any such designation exists in the charter. Anyone? Okay. Th there's so, my understanding is that upon enaction of 4.15 by the attorney general, all associate memberships would be dissolved. Is that correct? Except for ZBA, which they have full voting rights. Uh, I I'm going to offer an amendment, and here's the spirit of the amendment. Uh, we have appointed a number of associate memberships when sometimes we have a you know scarcity, sometimes we have a surplus. There was a recent situation on the uh, Council on Aging where we had three great, well-qualified candidates. We could only appoint one. We created two associateships. Those folks are fully functional. They're getting very integrated with their board. What I'd hate to have happen is for this document to be approved in March and those memberships evaporate. We may lose those folks. They may not come in for appointments at such point when they're authorized. So 
Uh, I'm going to, I have this in writing and I'm going to uh, read it first. I'm going to move to add the following sentence at the end of the new section, 4.15. Uh, associate members of boards and committees serving as of the effective date of section 4.15 shall be allowed to serve until the end of their terms or until 6-30-2015, whichever comes first. I think they all do expire that date, but I'm just being careful. That's, that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Lalasha. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is one of those several areas of, of really complex transitional thought. Um, we don't know, first of all, we don't know if town meeting's gonna approve this. Secondly, we don't know if the voters are gonna approve it. Third, we don't know what exactly what timing the special act may take. Um, the special act may approve the charter in time to send it to our voters. It may not require the voters. My point is there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, in, in discussing this internally uh, within the organization and, and to some small degree with, with one of the selectmen, the thinking was to uh, offer a bylaw at annual town meeting that would do something that Mr. Ensminger just suggested. What, again, this is the thinking that you don't want the charter to be too specific, although his amendment is seemingly perfectly fine. But there is some, some serious question about transition and there needs to be some serious discussion about what boards and committees should have associate members by design, and maybe that needs to go beyond the theoretical level of who is in place now as opposed to having it at all. So there is a mechanism to accomplish his um, goal that may be done through annual town meeting is my only real point. I don't see any harm in his amendment, though. Mr. Arena, you put your hand up. Pardon me? Oh, okay. Mr. Brown? Oh, well, I thought you were calling. Okay, we're all set on four. Mr. Mr. Doxer? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Doxer, Precinct 1. Um, so earlier this evening, we had Article 6 related to the Permanent Building Committee. And we created associate members who could vote. Now, from reading 4.15 as proposed, I'm perplexed. In the second paragraph, it sounds like Associate members can be defined by the Charter Town Bylaw or MGL. And then the next sentence says, in no case can they vote for 180 days. So I guess my question is, and possibly an amendment, have we said, yes, it's okay to do it, and then no in the same statement? No, I Brown? think, go ahead. I think that we changed the other to temporary members and not associate members on the uh, uh, Permanent Building Committee. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do it, to get rid of the conflict. Well done, thank you. Thank you. I, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> one of the few I get. Mr. Sasso? No. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Uh, so yeah, I picked up on this as well. and. Um, I mean, obviously one of the things I was thinking about was CPDC. I know we've had a lot of boards and commissions that have had the associate members, and I agree with your point that it's important if we do get them on bo onto boards and commissions to allow them to continue to serve. Um, I guess the question is, in, in, uh, just to, without a, a, a proposing an amendment here, but would you, s would you create the same approach if you instead just all appointed boards and committees authorized by the Article 4 may have associate members, period? Um, and just uh, because th really that's that's the per I mean I, I know in discussions we had with the Board of Selectmen years ago uh, specifically right around CPCC was you know as you define needs for different areas that to give you the, the it's, it still would be defined by the appointing by the appointing process but I mean that's the, that's a general perspective it's it's not limiting us in any way it doesn't you know uh, provide a specific you know issue in terms of pointing back to charter or bylaw and in the case of ZBA you you've defined it anyhow right. so it's okay so and then that kind of opens it up for everybody whether it's historical or or any of the other committees or commissions um, you're still going to define them through the appointing um, right. uh, authority which in most cases is the board of selectmen I, I think that we felt it would be better done in a bylaw and not in the charter. And, and that's fine too. I okay. mean, you, you, uh, but I'm just saying, at least from a charter perspective, if you, if you, um, 
well, I guess the point of the charter is that you've said here, if specified in the charter. Mm. And so yeah. you're not, uh, unless you're gonna go into every section and specify that we're gonna have so many associate members, um, and I don't think that's the, I don't no. think that's the intent. No. I think that's your concern. Right. Then I, I mean, maybe the, and the, and the answer is not every, not every board is, is specifically identified in a general bylaw, no. I, I don't think either. So I was just saying, just delete the whole, that whole end of the sentence and just say it may have associate members, period. And if you have bylaws like the one we just passed for the st uh, building committee that define those types of things, then so be it. Yeah. But uh, at are, least are this won't be in conflict. Are you going to offer an amendment for that? Uh, um, where would you suggest putting it in? Yeah, I, 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 it's up to you. I, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment, which would be instead get rid of that last sentence and just say um, yeah, it, all, all appointed boards or committees authorized by Article 4 may have associate members, period. And get rid of if specified in the Charter, Town Bylaw, or Massachusetts General Law. I think okay. he said he would rather let his amendment yep, stand. Yep. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll offer it as a separate amendment, okay. Mr. Moderator. All right. All right. Thank you. We, Mr. Pacino? Mr. Stubel and I are co-authors co of this, this particular section. Um, <laughs> the intent here is to allow for associate members, uh, and we felt that it should be done by three of the charter. Uh, the bylaw of mass general laws, we felt it was important that that be put in there to define that. The intent was also to come up with the appointing authority. And the third intent was in certain situations, it may be that the associate member could step up and actually assume the position and the full responsibilities of a regular member. Um, it could be, you know, we've used the historical commission and the demolition bylaws as a discussion. There's also a discussion of the Board of Health. If the Board of Health has a member and there's an important decision to be made relating to a health issue, and they don't have a quorum for that night, but there is an associate member who's in attendance that does qualify under this, that person could step up. And we visualize that that be set by those rules as to when they could step up be set by the appointing authority. Further discussion? Ms. O'Neill? Uh, yeah, as a member of the cemetery board trustee, I don't think we're gonna need any associates. We, we have about 5,000 of them. They don't speak up, though. <laughs> and, and they're also abstention vote. Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, I have a question. I don't understand why two committees here um, are not, do not have their specified number of members mentioned in here. Uh, I think that should be corrected. Uh, All the other committees have that. I don't see why the Historical Commission and the Town Forest Committee, since we are, you know, revising this, don't have that. I think that should be specified now in the charter it and not left. We already have both ex exist and operate, and I think we should have that in there. Uh, I think it currently is. I think the selectmen, if I'm correct, wanted it this direction because, as you may or may not recall, we had a land bank committee, which went defunct because there was nobody involved in it. We had. We had an insurance committee years ago. It went defunct because there was nobody in it, and yet it specified somebody in it. We felt that it gave the, the selectmen the flexibility. If the charter said seven and they couldn't fill it, they could drop it to five. Well, yeah. I don't quite buy that argument because CPDC has five members, and they haven't had five members in a long time. I think that's uh, very unfortunate. Okay. Um, it leads for better discussion if you have five people. So. I think these are two important committees to me, and they are not going anywhere. The Historical Commission is staying, and the Town Forest, we will have that, and that commission will stay. Those are not going anywhere. Yeah. So I think that we should um, definitely um, specify their membership and not leave that open. We have an existing Historical Commission that meets frequently, spends a lot of volunteer time, has no very little staff support, and I think is very disrespectful not to recognize that and have their number. I don't know if it's five or six, but I want to make an amendment that specifies the, I mean, I'm kind of curious as to what Jonathan has to say about this in terms of the historical commission, but uh, I would like to see this included in both of these. So I'd like to make an amendment that there shall be a historical, that that's in line with all the other committees. There shall be consisting of X number of members 
appointed by the Board of Selectmen with, with you know, the, the, the terms the way they're, they're phrased here. So mm -hmm. are there five full members of the Historical Commission currently? That's what the current charter, I okay. believe, calls for. Okay, so let's say that. It, it, I think Please. the simplest way, Mary Ellen, would go back to the original uh, thing under other committees, I think, in the original charter. If that's the intent yeah, of what you want to do. Is, okay, where is uh, that? I don't, right off the top of my head, I don't know. I, don't I think it, it was eight. It was way back in the old uh, eight something. Well, I don't see it in the translation guide. Yeah. It, so it, I it, it is in there, believe me. I just laid it down. E even I'm forgetting where stuff is, and that's unusual. But uh, I think we wanted to give the Board of Selectmen the flexibility. I don't want that given to the, okay. I don't want that, uh, very frankly. Uh, I want that to be a full committee. I want it to know that it's gonna have five members and its associate members. I think at minimum of five provides for a better discussion yeah. and a lot of input and they have a lot of people with, the, with various backgrounds on that commission. Now yeah. I don't want it to be reduced to three. Right. Um, for instance, that could happen depending on, you know, where the Board of Selectmen feel the importance yeah. of the historical commission is. I want that guaranteed, yeah. that there's five members, well, if that's okay. how we've operated okay. for so years. Are you, you offering two amendments? Well, one to each of those well, two. Could you give us the exact wording? Uh, well, I want it to be in the format, that's what I'm saying. There shall be a historical commission consisting of five members. We just want to put in that phrase, consisting of whatever their current membership is, historical commission, five members. There shall be a historical commission. The, all the other format is there shall be a conservation commission consisting of, there shall be a council of aging consisting of, so there, there shall be a historical commission consisting of five members appointed by the Board of Selectmen. So you're adding the words consisting of five members. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the other board. Or, but we have to make it consistent with the others. Or, whatever the conservation, for three-year terms so arranged that as near an equal number of terms as possible shall expire each year. Correct? Not the current, yeah. Yep. There should be a historical commission consisting of five members appointed by the Board of Selectmen for three-year terms so arranged that as near an equal number of terms as possible shall expire each year. Thank you, and so also I'm then now on the town force committee. I feel this is a very important um, committee within the town. That's a very valuable resource for all of us. So you want the same wording with the same number? Well, whatever. The, what is the current act? What is the current membership of? I don't know of the town force committee right now. I think it was originally five. I don't remember. Is it five or is it seven? I, I think it was seven, but that's one of the reasons that we wanted to vary because they couldn't get seven members. Mr. Mr. Lalashe? I think we have to have a number. We have to agree on one. Um, thank you, Ms. Moderator. I'll check online to see what the town forest committee is. A lot of people that usually go. Um, the selectmen are free to give their own opinions, but I just do want to clarify the selectmen didn't request this change. Okay. okay before you get to you, do we have a, oh, I'm sorry, do you have a, an answer? Mr. I'm Crook? sorry. I'm sorry for the mis misinformation. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. Um, looking at the current charter, Section 410, other committees, the selectmen shall appoint the following committees and determine the number of members of and their term of appointment not to exceed three years. Town Forest Committee, Historical Commission. Well, but now we're putting them in, in, a, in a format that gives them you know, like equal standing with the other committees, so let's treat them the same. So there shall be a town forest committee consisting of X members. Uh, excuse me, though. Uh, Mr. Crook, you, I, I don't have the, charter, uh, the uh, current charter in front of me, but currently we do not specify the number. So this is not a change. So this is not a change to the, to the charter, proposed change.
Is that correct? Yeah, it showed us a significant change of taking them out of that other and placing them as separate recognized committees. So let's but put them with the rest. But the change to specify a number is not within the scope, is why I That's read it. Come, no, come on. Is it, I, I don't have the charter in front of me. Do we specify a number today? No, then it is not within scope. Well, I think it's wrong. And let me go on record as saying that. That's wrong. Um, Mary Ellen, um, I think uh, the town manager said there was a lot of diversity in the vo um, committees and a lot of, uh, uh, if you will, diverse views. One of my views when I came on the committee, I felt that everything in what is now proposed for Article 4 should have been put in the bylaw for that particular reason because it's far simpler to change a bylaw than it is a charter, but I got outvoted. So is not, not our, uh, which is often the case at town meeting, but that's all right. I take my licks and I go home. Further discussion, Mr. Mon. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Reading from the translation guide, there's an addition to the charter proposed by the committee that says there shall be a town forest committee. That is a change. It seems to me that uh, an appropriate amendment would be to add to that statement, there shall be a town forest committee, which is a new addition, specifying how large that committee is. Because the, the charter committee has formed this as a committee, and now we can amend it to define what they what they specified. What is it? Oh, you, you may be right. That the problem I'm having here is I don't have a copy of the charter. And you, let me just take a look at this. You might, you might be right. That's, I, that is a good point, and I will now accept. Oh, what, Mr. Mr. Moore, do you have a comment? Richard Moore, Precinct 2. If you turn to page 22 of the change guide, you'll see the old wording, other boards or committees, uh, was section 4.10, specifying how the Town Forest Committee and the Historical Committee had previously been uh, written up in the charter. And you can see that it doesn't, it, it, it leaves in that wording that the number of people and how, and, and uh, it, on each of those committees will be up to the selectmen at the time that they, uh, at their whim, basically. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, this, is, this is a little confusing, and I apologize for this, but it. Yeah, just a couple of things. We basically, the, in terms of discussing this with the committee, uh, we left both the town forest and the historical commission in the bylaws, in the uh, charter. Getting late, I'm sorry. With the in, because these we felt were what they call protection of the town's resources. So that's why these two committees were left. We did not change the, the wording that was in the original charter. We just moved it to create these two new, two new committees. Just move them so they actually are show up better again because we felt it was protection of the town's resources. Just one second. I'm going to take a very quick recess. Could I, Mr. Meowers, can I talk to you? No, no, now you know why I was in the town manager's office every day. <laughs> yeah. And he says they're all my mistakes, but that's all right. <laughs> and, and he even threatened to uh, pay for email for me.
Sorry for the delay. This was a little tricky. Uh, uh, the decision is that they, the only changes that the Charter Commission is recommending is cosmetic. We have just moved them to another section. We have not proposed any changes. So that would be without, outside of the scope. Further discussion? Uh, Ms. Binder, I think, was next. Angela Binder, Precinct 5. Um, I have a few questions. I think it's always been assumed that there were five members and that it was in the charter for the Historical Commission. And I think the demolition delay bylaw is written so that it requires a four-fifth vote. Um, so I'm wondering if the selectmen decide to only have three members, how one could ever have a four-fifth vote if for whatever reason. So if those vacancies weren't, if those vacancies were there, then an associate member could step into that position for the purpose of a vote. But if there, if there weren't, then um, how, how, how would, if the selectmen decided for whatever reason to only have three members, how would one ever have a four-fifths vote? You're gonna have to put the pressure on the board of selectmen. Mr. Crook, do you have a comment? <laughs> Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. I think what would happen is you'd have to have three members out of three vote in the affirmative, and then you would exceed the threshold of four-fifths or 80%. Two out of three would not exceed the threshold of either four-fifths or the threshold of two-thirds, for example. Mr. Meares, did you have anything to add? Same thing. And okay. if there is not a, if there's not a specified number how would you have associate members step in to vote? How would you know how many members you needed to step in to vote? If, you know, if, if a full, if you needed a quorum, if you needed, how, how, would, how would you determine what a quorum was or what, if you? Mr. LaLasha. Um, thanks, Mr. Moderator. Um, first of all, you could do it in a bylaw. But secondly, as a matter of course, the selectmen appoint a lot of boards and committees that are not in the charter, and the Board of Selectmen has a whole booklet of policies where it specifies all this. Okay. Now, they have the right to change that, but it's not that it's mysterious or unknown. It's very much a public discussion and a public document. Okay, and I guess um, my last question is, um, the reasoning for an associate member not being able to step in and vote if they haven't served for 180 days, I understand the reasoning behind it, but if a full member were appointed, they would be able to vote the very next day if uh, a meeting was correct. held. So, so did you discuss the difference between, I mean, why would an associate member not be able to? to Again, I think the reason that most of the committee felt that, number one, we wanted the learning curve for them, even though you're right, they could do in the next day. But we also did not want an unscrupulous board of selectmen bringing in a ringer and saying, okay, you can vote. Appointing authority, I shouldn't say board of selectmen, I'm sorry. I'm picking on them, because they pick on me. Uh, he just says he liked them. But no, we just didn't feel that in the case of the demolition delay bylaw, let's say the week before, couple of members of the board said, gee, we don't like this, we, or we like this, we're gonna bring in uh, Angela Binder because she's, she's doing the way we wanna do it, okay? I don't think that's a fair, I don't think the committee felt that that was a fair thing. We, we want them to be there for a while before we give them the right to vote. Okay, but, but so that's an associate member, but yeah. somebody could be appointed to Abs full absolute, membership absolutely. and we vote have, the next we have, day. We have no control over that. That's up to the Board of Selectmen. If a vacancy comes the day before, they can do it. Go ahead, Phil. Mr. Vecino. The, okay. the intent would be, in terms of the associate member, is it'd be a very limited situation where the, where the member, where there was not sufficient members who are, per, I'm gonna use a, maybe the wrong term, but permanent members. If, that, if, there's a, if there's not a quorum in that particular case, that associate member, provided they qualified, would be able to step up and make a quorum <laughs> so that an important decision could get made. 
It would be, again, a, we would the Charter Commission viewed that as a very limited situation, that it only be, and those rules would be set by the appointing authority. If there's a particular issue, and I'll, I'll use the Board of Health, if the Board of Health has to make a decision that could affect the health, and they don't have a quorum for that night, an associate, and they have an associate member, that associate member could step up, take the place of that uh, member, providing they qualify, and then they could make the decision that would um, impact the citizens. Okay. Well, I understand the intent behind it, but I also think that just because of the number of vacancies, I mean, there are times when and it's not that you're bringing in a ringer, but it's hard to find people. So um, 180 days seems like a long time to to be. I, I think it would be in the scope to bring it down. It's, that's up to you. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to I'll town try council. Another, I'll try uh, another amendment. I'll, I'll How about changing it to 90 days? Uh, it, that just seems like a very long time. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Proposed amendment that that be, amendment that that be changed council? to 90 days it for the sake of, you know, boards that sometimes do need votes and do need members. Uh, and need town to council said he has no rule. Is there a second to those uh, the amendment? Yeah. Second. Okay. Would, would you split the difference? Go 120. <laughs> <laughs> further Com compromise. I just stick with 90. Further discussion. A and. Um, are you still? Uh, just uh, so, yeah. so I'm I'm proposing that amendment, and I just did you make a you did make a decision that adding number adding is out of scope. Is that correct to the historical and to forest? Yes, correct. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. So I will stand with my 90 days. All right. Okay. Further discussion? Yes, on the on the aisle. Saint three. Just wanted to get some additional clarification from Mr. Pacino on the associate membership. Um, in the event that a quorum is not available and an associate member is in place but has not been in place for either 90 or 180 days, um, will that mean that there is still no quorum and there is no vote capable of happening? That is correct. That's the intent. That's the intent of what we, what we got up there. Yes. Doesn't that kind of negate the whole point behind establishing an associate membership? No. I, again, we, the point that, we, that has been made is that we don't want a member who, to get appointed, who would be there for a specific, specific issue, and then after that meeting, get off the, resign as an associate member. Isn't it up to the Board of Selectmen when they make that appointment? to vet the person who they're going to appoint and the reason that they might be appointing an associate member might be because there are no additional spaces left on that particular board to appoint and so this is kind of just a, a safeguard or a, a, I mean it, it seems to me that you're designating an associate member as some kind of a, a lower level quality uh, qualified person, and I'm not sure that that's the intent. Mr. Brown. Uh, I think this presently associate members have no voting power, period. This would provide them that voting power after the 90 days. So um, uh, I see it as an improvement over what's there now. Quite frankly, the night of the demolition delay bylaw, and this is my own personal feeling, I watched two so-called associate members sit at the table. They have no more right, as far as I'm concerned, to sit at that table than I do, because they have no voting rights. This is at least going to allow somebody that may be a vo uh, associate member to be a voting member in case they need them. And I, I, I can appreciate that. My, my problem or my, my concern is that if the idea is to allow that person to have the authority to participate in making a quorum, but it happens within the first 90 or 180 days, then the point hasn't been, a, then we haven't accomplished anything. All we've got is somebody sitting there and not able to make any contribution. The, the intent is 
for 90 days or 180 days, whatever, whatever it is to be, it is, is to be a safeguard against the one issue member getting on and dealing only with that one issue and then removing it. <coughs> Mr. Mr. Stubel, you co-author, so why don't you come up and he, Mr. Can, he can explain too. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Jeff Strubel, Precinct 7. Uh, the idea of the associate membership here that we were trying to create is that associate members should be qualified alternates, um, not just someone who fills a seat. And that's one of the reasons we have the, wait the waiting period or the gestation period or whatever you want to call it. 180 days is just the number we that is put out first and uh, I don't necessarily disagree with 90, but the point was that in order to fulfill, I guess, the, the duties as a qualified member of that committee, they should essentially put in some time to, to know what the committee's doing rather than just uh, be allowed to be uh, put in the position the day before, literally, if, if necessary just to warm a seat or just to fill a seat. Uh, and then the, the possibility of graft was mentioned, you know, that you could be st stacking the deck for a particular vote, uh, particularly if something that, say something's been in committee and, and deadlocked for many, 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 many um, hours, you know, or many, many meetings, and all of a sudden the crucial vote's coming up, and all of a sudden there's a p possibility for a, um, you know, a, I guess an, an, old, a, uh, an associate to be appointed uh, to uh, to be able to take over and, and have full voting rights. You don't want that, if it's such a contentious issue, you don't want someone, a complete rookie to come in uh, and make a decision on something that the rest of the committee has been deliberating on for a long time. It's essentially a, uh, a learning period, not necessarily a penalty. It's meant to be a, a gestation period so that the associate member can come up to speed with what the committee is doing, and that's the main reason for it. I, I hear what you're saying, um, but I also want to comment on what Mrs. Binda had pointed out in that, and also what um, the selectman, Mr. Ensminger, had pointed out in the sense that in a particular situation like with the Council on Aging, there was one position available, they had three people qualified, and they appointed one person to be a full member and two people to be associate member. So in your scenario of this big um, event that needs to be voted on, three people are coming to the table that are have no more experience than any one of the 33 people, and yet one of those persons is going to have a vote where the other two people won't, that and there has been no learning, no learning period that has right. happened. I but think if the Board of Selectmen have made a decision to appoint somebody to a committee, that that person should have the same voting powers, whether they're an associate member or an a full member when there's a need for their vote at a time of a quorum establishment. Well, We're relying on the Board of Selectmen to make those decisions as to who's qualified and who's not qualified. And so now you've just basically said that, you know, when there's one position and three people, that one of them is more qualified than the others when that's maybe not the case. Right, but that, that provision or that, uh, that essentially would exist even when you start to say, for example, the building committee we just talked about uh, or just pa passed, you know, from day one, you know, they're all, they're all appointed, you know, and each one of them is appointed to a position and has no experience, yet they are qualified by the bylaw to make all kinds of votes. But uh, the so Board of Selectmen has established that they have the qualifications to be a member on the committee because they okay, appointed Okay, they have them. the qualifications, but the, 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 what you're talking about is, is appointing a full-blown member has nothing to do with, with, with associate membership. Associate uh, membership is something different. And you're, when trying to uh, link the two, I guess, and say, well, it's unfair that, um, you know, uh, you can appoint some, so a rookie, essentially, someone from scratch to a full, full position um, without having a, a learning curve, yes, that, that's but that's been in, that's been in that's been the situation since day one, as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> we're, what we're doing with the this this uh, bylaw amendment is to give conditions for how an associate member will uh, be able to step in and fulfill that position. So, uh, if if you call that a logical inconsistency, I would agree with you. But the fact fact is that's the way uh, appoint, 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 appointments have been. Um, and the conditions about, about appointments have been since, since day one, as far as I know. Just because it was done that way all the time doesn't <laughs> mean it's the right way. 
Um, I'd like to make but, a but further amendment. I, I think what you're asking then is that that would take sort of another another addition to the charter here to, to make that some sort of uh, prohibition, I guess, against stacking the deck with a, with a full-blown member. I'd like to make a further amendment. The um, amendment? That um, instead of saying in no case may an associate member vote on any issue, that we qualify it to the extent that if a quorum is required, that an associate member may step up regardless of the number of days that they've been on the board. Did we, did we get that in writing? Okay. One, two, three, four. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there a second? I have a second. Okay. Further discussion? Point of order. Point of order. You asked me for a quorum count? All right, uh, let's see. Uh, all of my counters are members of the committee here, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, um, Mr. Lippert, would you do the honor? Oh, uh, and for the your section plus the Board of Selectmen, that are, they're all members, right? Yes. Uh, Ms. Folds, would you uh, take the right <laughs> side up to the, um, to the wire? Uh, Mr. Mon, would you take the, the other half of the center? And let's see, um, Mr. Russell, would you <laughs> take the left? Uh, this is a quorum count, please rise. Twenty-one. Nineteen. Nineteen. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. 21. We have 83 people. We are 14 short of a quorum. This town meeting stands adjourned until tomorrow night. <laughs>